Section 8 of Actions and Reactions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cornel Nemesh in Reno, Nevada. Actions and Reactions by Rudyard Kipling The Four Angels As um, Adam lay a dreaming beneath the apple tree, the angel of the earth came down and offered earth in fee. But Adam did not need it, nor the plow he would not spit it, singing earth and water, air and fire, what more can mortal man desire? The apple trees in bud. As Adam lay a dreaming beneath the apple tree, the angel of the waters offered all the seas in fee. But Adam would not take them, nor the ships he wouldn't make them. Singing, water, earth, and air, and fire, what more can mortal men desire? The apple trees in leaf. As Adam lay a dreaming beneath the apple tree, the angel of the air he offered all the air in fee. But Adam did not crave it, nor the flight he wouldn't brave it, singing, air and water, earth and fire, what more can mortal man desire? the apple trees in bloom. As Adam lay a dreaming beneath the apple tree, the angel of the fire rose up, and not a word said he. But he wished a fire and made it. And in Adam's heart he laid it, singing, Fire, fire, burning fire, Stand up and reach your heart's desire. The apple blossom set. As Adam was a working outside of Eden Wall, he used the earth, he used the seas, he used the air and all, and out of black disaster he arose to be the master of earth and water, air and fire but never reached his heart's desire. The apple trees cut down. End of section 8 Recording by Cornel Nemesh in Reno, Nevada Section 9 of Actions and Reactions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Naveen. Actions and Reactions by Rudyard Kipling. A Deal in Cotton. Long and long ago, when Devadatta was king of Benares, I wrote some tales concerning Strickland of the Punjab police who married Miss Yugo 
and Adam, his son. Strickland has finished his Indian service and lives now at a place in England called Western Super Mare, where his wife plays the organ in one of the churches. Some occasionally he comes up to London, and occasionally his wife makes him visit his friends. Otherwise, he plays golf and follows the Harriers for his figure's sake. If you remember that infant who told the tale to Eustace Cleaver the novelist, you will remember that he became a baronet with a vast estate. He has, owing to cookery, a little lost his figure, but he never loses his friends. I have found a wing of his house turned into a hospital for sick men, and there I once spent a week in the company of two dismal nurses and a specialist in sprue. Another time the place was full of schoolboys, sons of Anglo-Indians whom the infant had collected for the holidays, and they nearly broke his keeper's heart. But my last visit was better. The infant called me up by wire, and I fell into the arms of a friend of mine, Colonel A. L. Corcoran, so that the years departed from us, and we praised Allah, who had not yet terminated the delights, nor separated the companions. Said Corcoran, when he had explained how it felt to command a native infantry regiment on the border, the Strix are coming for tonight with their boy. I remember him, the little fellow I wrote a story about, I said. Is he in the service? No. Strick got him into the Central Euro-Africa Protectorate. He's assistant commissioner at Dupe, wherever that is. Somaliland, ain't it, Stocky? asked the infant. Stocky puffed out his nostrils scornfully. You're only 3,000 miles out. Look at the atlas. Anyhow, he's as rotten full of fever as the rest of you, said the infant, at length on the big divan, and he's bringing a native servant with him. Stocky be an athlete, and tell Ips to put him in the stable room. Why, is he a yow, like the fellow Wade brought here, when your housekeeper had fits? Stocky often visits the infant, and has seen some odd things. No, he's one of old Strickland's Punjabi policemen, and quite European, I believe. Hooray! Haven't talked Punjabi for three months, and a Punjabi from Central Africa ought to be amusing. We heard the chuff of the motor in the porch, and the first to enter was Agnes Strickland whom the infant makes no secret of adoring. He is devoted, in a fat man's placid way, to at least eight designing women. But she nursed him once through a bad bout of Peshawar fever, and when she is in the house, it is more than all hers. You didn't send rugs enough, she began. Adam might have taken a chill. It's quite warm in the tunnel. Why did you let him ride in front? Because he wanted to, she replied with a mother's smile, and we were introduced to the shadow of a young man leaning heavily on the shoulder of a bearded Punjabi Mohammedan. That is all that came home of him, said his father to me. There was nothing in it of the child with whom I had journeyed to Dalhousie centuries since. And what is this uniform? Stocky asked of Imam Din, the servant, who came to attention on the marble floor. The uniform of the protectorate troops, Sahib. Though I am the little Sahib's body servant, it is not seemly for us white men to be attended by folk dressed altogether as servants. And and you white men wait at table on horseback? Stocky pointed to the man's spurs. These I added for the sake of honor when I came to England, said Iman Din. Adam smiled the ghost of a little smile that I began to remember, and we put him on the big couch for refreshments. Stocky asked him how much leave he had, and he said six months. But he'll take another six on medical certificate, said Agnes anxiously. Adam knit his brows. You don't want to, eh? I know. Wonder what my second in command is doing. Stocky tugged his mustache and fell to thinking of his Sikhs. Ah, said the infant, I've only a few thousand peasants to look after. Come along and dress for dinner. We're just ourselves. What flower is your honor's ladyship commanding for the table? Just ourselves, she said, looking at the crotons in the great hall. Then let's have marigolds, the little cemetery ones. So it was ordered. Now, marigolds to us mean hot weather, discomfort, parting, and death. That smell in our nostrils and Adam's servant in waiting, we naturally fell back more and more on the old slang, recalling at each glass those who had gone before. We did not sit at the big table, but in the bay window overlooking the park, where they were carting the last of the hay. When twilight fell, we would not have candles, but waited for the moon, and continued our talk in the dusk that makes one remember. Young Adam was not interested in our past, except where it had touched his future. I think his mother held his hand beneath the table.
Imam Din, shoeless, out of respect to the floors, brought him his medicine, poured it drop by drop, and asked for orders. Wait to take him to his cot when he grows weary, said his mother, and Imam Din retired into the shadow by the ancestral portraits. Now, what do you expect to get out of your country? the infant asked, when our India laid aside, we talked Adam's Africa. It roused him at once. Rubber, nuts, gums, and so on, he said, but our real future is cotton. I grew 50 acres of it last year in my district. My district, said his father. Hear him, mummy. I did, though. I wish I could show you the sample. Some Manchester sap said it was good as any sea island cotton on the market. But what made you a cotton planter, my son, she asked. My chief said every man ought to have a shook, a hobby, of sorts, and he took the trouble to ride a day out of his way to show me a belt of black soil that was just a thing for cotton. Ah, what was your chief like, Stocky asked, in his silkiest tones. The best man alive, absolutely. He lets you blow your own nose yourself. The people call him, Adam jerked out some heathen phrase, that means the man with the stone eyes, you know. I'm glad of that, because I've heard from other quarters Stocky's sentence burned like a slow match, but the explosion was not long delayed. Other quarters! Adam threw out a thin hand. Every dog has his fleas. If you listen to them, of course. The shake of his head was as I remembered it among his father's policemen twenty years before, and his mother's eyes, shining through the dusk, called on me to adore it. I kicked Stocky on the shin. One must not mock a young man's first love or loyalty. A lump of raw cotton appeared on the table. I thought there might be a need, therefore I packed it between our shirts, said the voice of Imam Din. Does he know as much English as that? cried the infant, who had forgotten his East. We all admire the cotton for Adam's sake, and indeed it was very long and glossy. It's, it's only an experiment, he said. We're such awful paupers we can't even pay for a mail cart in my district. We use a biscuit box on two bicycle wheels. I only got the money for that, he patted the stuff, by a pure fluke. How much did it cost? asked Strickland. With seed and machinery? About two hundred pounds. I had the labor done by cannibals. That sounds promising. Stocky reached for a fresh cigarette. No, thank you, said Agnes. I've been at Weston Super Mare a little too long for cannibals. I'll go to the music room and try over next Sunday's hymns. She lifted the boy's hand lightly to her lips and tripped across the acres of glimmering floor to the music room that had been the infant's ancestor's banqueting hall. Her grand silver dress disappeared under the musician's gallery. Two electrics broke out, and she stood back against the lines of gilded pipes. There's an abominable self-playing attachment here, she called. Me, the infant answered, his napkin on his shoulder. That's how I play Parsifal. I preferred the direct expression. Take it away, Ips. We heard old Ips skating obediently all over the floor. Now for the direct expression, said Stocky, and moved on the burgundy recommended by the faculty to enrich fever-thin blood. It's nothing much. Only the belt of cotton soil my chief showed me ran right into the Shishahaley country. We haven't been able to prove cannibalism against that tribe in the courts. But when a Shishahaley offers you four pounds of women's breast, tattoos, marks, and all, skewered up in a plantain leaf before breakfast, you... Naturally, burn the villages before lunch, said Stocky. Adam shook his head. No troops, he sighed. I told my chief about it, and he said we must wait till they chopped a white man. He advised me if I ever felt like it not to commit a, a barren fellow de say, but to let the Shishahilly do it. Then he could report, and then we could mop him up. Most immoral. That's how we got. Stocky quoted the name of a province won by just such a sacrifice. Yes, but the beast dominated one end of my cotton belt like anything. They chivied me out of it when I went to take soil for analysis. Me and Imam Din. Sahib, is there a need? The voice came out of the darkness, and the eyes shone over Adam's shoulder ere it ceased. None. The name was taken in talk. Adam abolished him with a turn of the finger. I couldn't make a casus belly out of it just then, because my chief had taken all the troops to hammer a gang of slave kings up north. Did you ever hear of our war against Ibn Makara? He precious nearly lost to the protectorate at one time, though he's an ally of ours now. Wasn't he a rather pernicious brute, even as they go, said Stocky. Wade told me about him last year. Well, his nickname all through the country was The Merciful, and he didn't get that for nothing. 
None of our people ever breathed his proper name. They said he or that one, and they didn't say it aloud either. He fought us for eight months. I remember there was a paragraph about it in one of the papers, I said. We broke him, though. No, the slavers don't come our way because our men have the reputation of dying too much the first month after they're captured. That knocks down profits, you see. What about your charming friends, the Shashahaley, said the infant. There's no market for Shashahaley. People would as soon buy crocodiles. I believe before we annexed the country, Ibn Makara had dropped down on him once to train his young men and simply hewed him in pieces. The bulk of my people are agriculturists, just the right stamp for cotton growers. What's mother playing? Once in royal? The organ that had been crooning as happily as a woman over her babe restored, steady to a tune. Magnificent, oh magnificent, said the infant loyally. I had never heard him sing but once, and then, though it was early in the tolerant morning, his mess had rolled him into a lotus pond. How did you get your cannibals to work for you? asked Strickland. They got converted to civilization after my chief smashed Ibn Makara, just at the time I wanted them. You see, my chief had promised me in writing that if I could scrape up a surplus, he would not bag it for his rose this time, but I might have it for my cotton gain. I only needed 200 pounds. Our revenues didn't run to it. What is your revenue? Stocky asked in the vernacular. With hut tax, trader's game, and mining licenses, not more than 14,000 rupees, every penny of it earmarked months ahead, Adam sighed. Also, there is a fine for dog straying in the sahib's camp. Last year it exceeded three rupees, Imam Din said quietly. Well, I thought that was fair. They howled so. We were rather strict on fines. I worked up my native clerk, Bulaki Ram, to a ferocious pitch of enthusiasm. He used to calculate the profits of our cotton scheme to three points of decimals after office. I tell you, I envied your magistrates here, hauling money out of motorists every week. I had managed to make our ordinary revenue and expenditure just about me, and I was crazy to get the odd 200 pounds for my cotton. That sort of thing grows on a chap when he's alone, and talks aloud. Hello. Have you been there already? The father said, and Adam nodded. Yes. Used to spout what I could remember of Marmion to a tree, sir. Well, then my luck turned. One evening, an English-speaking nigger came in towing a corpse by the feet. You get used to little things like that. He said he'd found it, and please would I identify, because if it was one of Ibn Makara's men, there might be a reward. It was an old Mohammedan, with a strong dash of Arab, a small-boned, bald-headed chap, and I was just wondering how it had kept so well in our climate when it sneezed. You ought to have seen the nigger. He fetched a howl and bolted like like the dog in Tom Sawyer when he sat on the what's-his-name beetle. He yelped as he ran, and the corpse went on sneezing. I could see it had been sarkied. That's a sort of gum poison, patter, which attacks the nerve centers. Our chief medical officer is writing a monograph about it. So, Imam Din and I emptied out the corpse one time with my shaving soap and trade gunpowder and hot water. I'd seen a case of sarky before, so when the skin peeled off his feet and he stopped sneezing, I knew he'd live. He was bad, though, lay like a log for a week while Imam Din and I massaged the paralysis out of him. Then he told us he was a haji, had been three times to Mecca, come in from French Africa, and that he'd met the nigger by the wayside, just like a case of thuggy in India, and the nigger had poisoned him. That seemed reasonable enough by what I knew of coast niggers. You believed him? said his father keenly. There was no reason I shouldn't. The nigger never came back, and the old man stayed with me for two months, Adam returned. You know what the best type of a Mohammedan gentleman can be, Patter? He was that. None finer, none finer, was the answer. Except a Sikh, Stocky grunted. He'd been to Bombay. He knew French Africa inside out. He could quote poetry and the Quran all day long. He played chess. You don't know what that meant to me, like a master. We used to talk about the regeneration of Turkey and the Sheikh ul Islam between moves. Oh, everything under the sun we talked about. He was awfully open-minded. He believed in slavery, of course, but he quite saw that it would have to die out. That's why he agreed with me about developing the resources of the district by cotton growing, you know. You talked of that, too? asked Strickland. Rather, we discussed it for hours. You don't know what it meant to me. A wonderful man. 
Imam Din was not our Haji marvelous? Most marvelous. It was all through the Haji that we found the money for our cotton play. Imam Din had moved, I fancy, behind Strickland's chair. Yes, it must have been dead against his convictions, too. He brought me news when I was down with fever at Dupe that one of Ibn Makara's men was parading through my district with a bunch of slaves. In the fork! What's the matter with the fork? That you can't abide it, said Stocky. Adam's voice had risen at the last word. Local etiquette, sir, he replied, too earnest to notice Stocky's atrocious pun. If a slaver runs slaves through British territory, he ought to pretend that they're his servants, hawking them about in the fork. The fork stick that you put round their necks, you know, is insolence, same as not backing your topsails in the old days. Besides, it unsettles the district. I thought you said slavers didn't come your way, I put in. They don't, but my chief was smoking them out of the north all that season, and they were bolting into French territory any road they could find. My orders were to take no notice so long as they circulated, but open slave during the fork was too much. I couldn't go myself, so I told a couple of our Makalali police and Imam Din to make talk with the gentleman one time. It was rather risky, and it might have been expensive, but turned up trumps. They were back in a few days with the slaver. He didn't show fight, and a whole crowd of witnesses, and we tried him in my bedroom, and find him properly, just to show you how demoralized the brute must have been. Arabs often go dotty after a defeat. He'd snapped up four or five utterly useless Seishahili, and was offering them to all and sundry along the road. Why, he offered them to you, didn't he, Mamdin? I was witness that he offered man-eaters for sale, said Mamdin. Luckily for my cotton scheme, that landed him both ways. You see, he had slaved and exposed slaves for sale in British territory. That meant the double fine if I could get it out of him. What was his defense, said Strickland, late of the Punjab police? As far as I remember, but I had a temperature of 104 degrees at the time. He'd mistaken the meridians of longitude. Thought he was in French territory. Said he'd never do it again if we let him off with a fine. I got a shaken hands with a brute for that. He paid up cash like a motorist and went off one time. Did you see him? Yes, didn't I, Mamdin? Assuredly, the sahib both saw and spoke to the slaver. And the sahib also made a speech to the man-eaters when he freed them and they swore to supply him with labor for all his cotton play. The sahib leaned on his own servant's shoulder the while. I remember something of that. I remember Bulaki Ram giving me the papers to sign, and I distinctly remember him locking up the money in the safe. Two hundred and ten beautiful English sovereigns. You don't know what that meant to me. I believe it cured my fever, and as soon as I could, I staggered off with the haji to interview the Sheshaheli about labor. Then I found out why they had been so keen to work. It wasn't gratitude. Their big village had been hit by lightning and burned out a week or two before, and they lay flat in rows around me asking me for a job. I gave it them. And so you were very happy his mother had stolen up behind us. You liked your cotton, dear? She tidied the lump away. By Jove, I was happy. Adam yawned. Now, if anyone, he looked at the infant, cares to put a little money into the scheme, it will be the making of my district. I can't give you figures, sir, but I assure you will take your arsenic and Imam Din will take you up to bed and I'll come and tuck you in. Agnes leaned forward, her rounded elbows on his shoulders, hands joined across his dark hair, and, isn't he a darling, she said to us, with just the same heart-rending lift to the left eyebrow and the same break of her voice as sent Strickland mad among the horses in the year 84. We were quiet when they were gone. We waited till Imam Din returned to us from above and coughed at the door, as only dark-hearted Asia can. Now, said Strickland, tell us what truly befell, son of my servant. As befell, as our sahib has said, only, only there's an arrangement, a little arrangement on account of his cotton play. Tell, sit, I beg your pardon, infant, said Strickland. But the infant had already made the sign, and we heard Imam Din hunker down on the floor. One gets little out of the East at attention. When the fever came on our sahib in our roofed house at Dupe, he began, the haji listened intently to his talk. He expected the names of women, though I had already told him that our virtue was beyond belief or compare, and that our sole desire was this cotton play. Being at last convinced, the haji breathed on our sahib's forehead, 
to sink into his brain news concerning a slave dealer in his district who had made a mock of the law. Sahib, Imam Din turned to Strickland. Our Sahib answered to those false words as a horse of blood answers to the spur. He sat up. He issued orders for the apprehension of the slave dealer. Then he fell back. Then we left him. Alone, servant of my son and son of my servant, said his father. There was an old woman which belonged to the Haji. She had come in with the Haji's money belt. The Haji told her that if our Sahib died, she would die with him. And truly, our Sahib had given me orders to depart. Being mad with fever, eh? What can we do, Sahib? This cotton play was his heart's desire. He talked of it in his fever. Therefore, it was his heart's desire that the Haji went to fetch. Doubtless, the Haji could have given him money enough out of hand for ten cotton plays. But in this respect also, our Sahib's virtue was beyond belief or compare. Great ones do not exchange monies. Therefore the Haji said, and I helped with my counsel, that we must make arrangements to get the money in all respects conformable with the English law. It was great trouble to us, but the law is the law. And the Haji showed the old woman the knife by which she would die if our Sahib died. So I accompanied the Haji. Knowing who he was, said Strickland, no, fearing the man. A virtue went out from him, overbearing the virtue of lesser persons. The Haji told Bulaki Ram, the clerk, to occupy the seat of government at Dup till our return. Bulaki Ram feared the Haji because the Haji had often gloatingly appraised his skill and figures at 5,000 rupees upon any slave block. The Haji then said to me, Come, and we will make the man-eaters play the cotton game for my delight's delight. The Haji loved our sahib with the love of a father for his son, of a saved for a savior, of a great one for a great one. But I said, we cannot go to that Sheshaheli place without a hundred rifles. We have here five. The Haji said, I have untied as not in my head handkerchief, which will be more to us than a thousand. I saw that he had so loosed it that it lay flagwise on his shoulder. Then I knew that he was a great one with virtue in him. We came to the highlands of the Sheshaheli on the dawn of the second day, about the time of the stirring of the cold wind. The Haji walked delicately across the open place where their filth is, and scratched upon the gate which was shut. When it opened, I saw the man-eaters lying on their cots under the eaves of the huts. They rolled off, they rose up, one behind the other the length of the street, and the fear on their faces was as leaves whitening to a breeze. The Haji stood in the gate, guarding his skirts from defilement. The Haji said, I am here once again, giving me six and yoke up. They jealously then pushed to us with poles six, and yoked them with a heavy tree. The Haji then said, Fetch fire from the morning hearth, and come to windward. The wind is strong on those headlands at sunrise, so when each had emptied his crock of fire in front of that which was before him, the broadside of the town roared into flame, and all went. The Haji then said, At the end of a time there will come here the white man you once chased for sport. He will demand labor to plant such and such stuff. Ye are that labor, and your spawn after you. They said, lifting their heads a very little from the edge of the ashes. We are that labor, and our spawn after us. The Haji said, What is also my name? They said, Thy name is also the merciful. The Haji said, Praise then my mercy. And while they did this, the Haji walked away, I following. The infant made some noise in his throat, and reached for some more burgundy. About noon, one of our six fell dead. Fright only frights Sahib. None had, none could touch him. Since they were in pairs, and the other of the fork was mad and sang fiercely, we waited for some heathen to do what was needful. There came at last Angari men with goats. The Haji said, What do ye see? They said, Oh, our Lord, we neither see nor hear. The Haji said, But I command ye to see, and to hear, and to say. They said, O oh, our Lord, it is to our commanded eyes as though slaves stood in a fork. The Haji said, So testify before the officer who waits you in the town of Dupe. They said, What shall come to us after? The Haji said, The just reward for the informer. But if ye do not testify, then a punishment which shall cause birds to fall from the trees in terror and monkeys to scream for pity. Hearing this, the Angari men hastened to Dupe. The Haji then said to me, Are those things sufficient to establish our case, or must I drive in a village full? 
I said that three witnesses amply established any case, but as yet, I said, the Haji had not offered his slave for sale. It is true, as our Sahib said just now, there is one fine for catching slaves, and yet another for making to sell them. And it was the double fine that we needed, Sahib, for our Sahib's cotton play. We had four arranged all this with Bulaki Ram, who knows the English law, and I thought the Haji remembered, but he grew angry and cried out, O oh God, refuge of the afflicted, must I, who am what I am, peddle this dog's meat by the roadside to gain his delight from my heart's delight? Nonetheless, he admitted it was the English law, and so he offered me the six, five, in a small voice, with an averted head. The Sheshaheli do not smell of sour milk as heathen should. They smell like leper and sahib. This is because they eat men. Maybe, said Strickland, but where were thy wits? One witness is not sufficient to establish the fact of a sale. What could we do, sahib? There was the Haji's reputation to consider. We could not have called in a heathen witness for such a thing. And moreover, the sahib forgets that the defendant himself was making this case. He would not contest his own evidence. Otherwise, I know the law of evidence well enough. So then we went to Duke, and while Bulaki Ram waited among the Angari men, I ran to see our sahib in bed. His eyes were very bright, and his mouth was full of upside-down orders. But the old woman had not loosened her hair for death. The haji said, Be quick with my trial. I am not Job. The haji was a learned man. We made the trial swiftly to a sound of soothing voices round the bed. Yet, yet, because no man can be sure whether a sahib of that blood sees or does not see, we made it strictly in the manner of the forms of the English law. Only the witnesses and the slaves and the prisoner we kept without for his nose's sake. Then he did not see the prisoner, said Strickland. I stood by to shackle up an agari in case he should demand it. But by God's favor, he was too far fevered to ask for one. It is quite true he signed the papers. It is quite true he saw the money put away in the safe. Two hundred and ten English pounds, and it is quite true that the gold wrought on him as a strong cure. But as to his seeing the prisoner and having speech with the man-eaters, the haji breathed all that on his forehead to sink into a sick brain. A little, as ye have heard, has remained. Ah, but when the fever broke, and our sahib called for the fine book, and the thin little picture books from Europe with the pictures of plows and hoes and cotton mills, ah, then he laughed as he used to laugh, sahib. It was his heart's desire, this cotton play. The haji loved him, as who does not? It was a little, little arrangement, sahib of which is it necessary to tell all the world? And when didst thou know who the haji was? said Strickland. Not for a certainty till he and our sahib had returned from their visit to the Sheshaheli country. It is quite true, as our sahib says, the man-eaters lay flat around his feet and asked for spades to cultivate cotton. That very night, when I was cooking the dinner, the haji said to me, I go to my own place, though God knows whether the man with the stone eyes have left me an ox, a slave, or a woman. I said, Thou art then that one? The haji said, I am ten thousand rupees reward into thy hand. Shall we make another law case and get more cotton machines for the boy? I said, What dog am I to do this? May God prolong thy life a thousand years. The haji said, Who has seen tomorrow? God has given me as it were a son in my old age, and I praise him. See that the breed is not lost. He walked then from the cooking place to our sahib's office table under the tree, where our sahib held in his hand a blue envelope of service, newly come in by runner from the north. At this, fearing evil news for the haji, I would have restrained him. But he said, We be both great ones. Neither of us will fail. Our sahib looked up to invite the haji to approach before he opened the letter. But the haji stood off till our sahib had well opened and well read the letter. Then the haji said, Is it permitted to say farewell? Our sahib stabbed the letter on the file with a deep and joyful breath and cried a welcome. The haji said, I go to my own place and he loosed from his neck a chained heart of ambergris set in soft gold and held it forth. Our sahib snatched it swiftly in the closed fist, downturned, and said, If thy name be written hereon, it is needless, for a name is already engraved on my heart. The haji said, And on mine also is a name engraved, but there is no name on the amulet. The haji stooped to our sahib's feet, but our sahib raised and embraced him. 
The Haji covered his mouth with his shoulder cloth because it worked, and so he went away. And what order was in the service letter? Stocky murmured. Only an order for our sahib to write a report on some new cattle sickness. But all orders come in the same make of envelope. We could not tell what order it might have been. When he opened the letter, my son, made he no sign? A cough? An oath? Strickland asked. None, sahib. I washed his hands. They did not shake. Afterward, he wiped his face, but he was sweating before from the heat. Did he know? Did he know who the haji was? said the infant in English. I am a poor man. Who can say what a sahib of that get knows or does not know? But the haji is right. The breed should not be lost. It is not very hot for little children and dupe, and as regards nurses, my sister's cousin and jewel, hmm, that is the boy's own concern. I wonder if his chief ever knew, said Strickland. Assuredly, said Imam Din. On the night before our sahib went down to the sea, the great sahib, the man with the stone eyes, dined with him in his camp, I being charged at the table. They talked a long while, and the great sahib said, What didst thou think of that one? We did not say Ibn Makarah yonder. Our sahib said, Which one? The great sahib said, That one which thought thy man-eaters should grow cotton for thee. He was in thy district three months to my certain knowledge, and I looked by every runner that thou wouldst send me in his head. Our sahib said, If his head had been needed, another man should have been appointed to govern my district, for he was my friend. The great sahib laughed and said, If I had needed a lesser man in thy place, be sure I would have sent him, as if I had needed the head of that one, be sure I would have sent men to bring it to me. But tell me now, by what means did thou twist him to thy use and our profit in this cotton play? Our sahib said, By God, I did not use that man in any fashion whatever. He was my friend. The great sahib said, Toh va, bosh, tell. Our sahib shook his head as he does, as he did when a child. And they looked at each other like sword play men at, in the ring at a fair. The great sahib dropped his eyes first and he said, So be it. I should perhaps have answered thus in my youth. No matter. I have made treaty with that one as an ally of the state. Some day he shall tell me the tale. Then I brought in fresh coffee, and they ceased. But I do not think that one will tell the great sahib more than our sahib told him. Wherefore? I asked. Because they are both great ones, and I have observed in my life that great ones employ words very little between each other in their dealings, still less when they speak to a third concerning those dealings. Also they profit by silence. Now I think that the mother has come down from the room, and I will go rub his feet till he sleeps. His ears had caught Agnes's step at the stairhead, and presently she passed us on her way to the music room, humming the Magnificat. End of section 9. Recording by Naveen. Section 10 of Actions and Reactions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Kibbe. Actions and Reactions by Rudyard Kipling. The New Knighthood. Who gives him the bath? I, said the wet, rank jungle sweat. I'll give him the bath. Who'll sing the psalms? We, said the palms. Ere the hot wind becomes, we'll sing the psalms. Who lays on the sword? I, said the sun, before he is done, I'll lay on the sword. Who fastens his belt? I, said short rations, I know all the fashions of tightening a belt. Who buckles his spur? I, said his chief, exacting and brief, I'll give him the spur. Who'll shake his hand? I, said the fever, and I'm no deceiver, I'll shake his hand. Who brings him the wine? I, said quinine, it's a habit of mine, I'll come with his wine. Who will put him to proof? I, said all earth, whatever he's worth, I'll put to the proof. Who will choose him for night? I, said his mother, before any other, my very own knight. And after this fashion adventure to seek was Sir Galahad made, as it might be last week. End of section 10
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org actions and reactions by rudyard kipling the puzzler i had not seen penfentenyu since the middle nineties when he was minister of ways and woodsides in de florar's first administration last summer though he nominally held the same portfolio he was his colony's premier in all but name and the idol of his own province which is two and a half times the size of england politically his creed was his growing country and he came over to england to develop a great idea in her behalf believing that he had put it in train i made haste to welcome him to my house for a week that he was chased to my door by his own agent-general in a motor that they turned my study into a cabinet meeting which i was not invited to attend that the local telegraph all but broke down beneath the strain of hundred word coded cables and that i practically broke into the house of a stranger to get him telephonic facilities on a sunday are things i overlook what i objected to was his ingratitude while i thus tore up england to help him so i said why on earth didn't you see your opposite number in town instead of bringing your office work here eh who said he looking up from his fourth cable since lunch see the english minister for ways and woodsides i saw him said penfentenyu without enthusiasm it seemed that he had called twice on the gentleman but without an appointment i thought if i wasn't big enough my business was and each time had found him engaged a third party intervening suggested that a meeting might be arranged if due notice were given then said penfentenyu i called at the office at ten o'clock but they'd be in bed i cried one of the babies was awake he told me that that my sort of questions he slapped the pile of cables were only taken between eleven and two so i waited and when you got to business i asked he made a gesture of despair it was like talking to children they'd never heard of it and your opposite number penfenten you described him hush you mustn't talk like that i shuddered he's one of the best of good fellows you should meet him socially i've done that too he said have you heaven forbid i cried but that's the proper thing to say oh he said all the proper things only i thought as this was england that they'd more or less have the hang of all the general hang together of my idea but i had to explain it from the beginning ah they probably mislaid the papers i said and i told him the story of a three million pound insurrection caused by a deputy under-secretary sitting upon a mass of green labelled correspondence instead of reading it i wonder it doesn't happen every week he answered do you mind my having the agent-general to dinner again to-night i'll wire and he can motor down the agent-general arrived two hours later a patient and expostulating person visibly torn between the pulling devil of a rampant colony and the placid baker of a largely uninterested england but with penfentenyu behind him he had worked for he told us that lord lundy the law lord was the final authority on the legal and constitutional aspects of the great idea and to him it must be referred good heavens alive thundered penfentenyu i told you to get that settled last christmas it was the middle of the house-party season said the agent-general mildly lord lundy's at creedence green now he spends his holidays there it's only forty miles off shan't i disturb his holiness said penfentenyu heavily perhaps my sort of questions he snorted mayn't be discussed except at midnight oh don't be a child i said what this country needs said penfentenyu is and for ten minutes he trumpeted rebellion what you need is to pay for your own protection i cut in when he drew breath and i showed him a yellowish paper supplied gratis by government which is called schedule d to my merciless delight he had never seen the thing before and i completed my victory over him and all the colonies with a brassey's naval annual and a statesman year book the agent-general interposed with agent generalities but they were merely provocateurs about ties of sentiment they be blowed said penfentenyu what's the good of sentiment towards a kindergarten quite so ties of common funk are the things that bind us together 
and the sooner you new nations realize it the better what you need is an annual invasion then you'd grow up thank you thank you said the agent general that's what i am always trying to tell my people but my dear fool penfentenu almost wept do you pretend that these banana-fingered amateurs at home are grown up you poor serious pagan man i retorted if you take him that way you'll wreck your great idea will you take him to lord lundy's to-morrow said the agent-general promptly i suppose i must i said if you won't not me i'm going home said the agent-general and departed i am glad that i am no colony's agent-general penfentenu continued to argue about naval contributions till one fifteen a m though i was victor from the first at ten o'clock i got him and his correspondence into the motor and he had the decency to ask whether he had been unpolished overnight i replied that i waited an apology this he made excuse for renewed arguments and used wayside shows as illustrations of the decadence of england for example we burst a tire within a mile of credence green and to save time walked into the beautifully kept little village his eye was caught by a building of pale blue tin stenciled calvinist chapel before whose shuttered windows an italian organ-grinder with a petticoated monkey was playing dolly gray yes that's it snapped the egoist that's a parable of the general situation in england and look at those brutes a huge household removals van was halted at a public house the men in charge were drinking beer from blue and white mugs it seemed to me a pretty sight but penfentenu said it represented our national attitude lord lundy's summer resting place we learned was a farm a little out of the village up a hill round which curled a high hedged road only an initiated few spend their holidays at credence green and they have trained the householders to keep the place select penfentenu made a grievance of this as we walked up the lane followed at a distance by the organ-grinder suppose he is having a house-party he said anything's possible in this insane land just at that minute we found ourselves opposite an empty villa its roof was of black slate with bright unweathered ridge tiling its walls were of blood-coloured brick cornered and banded with vermiculated stucco work and there was cobalt magenta and purest apple-green window-glass on either side of the front door the whole was fenced from the road by a low brick-pillared flint wall topped with a cast-iron gothic rail picked out in blue and gold tight beds of geranium calceolaria and lobelia speckled the glass plat from whose centre rose one of the finest araucarias its other name by the way is monkey puzzler that it has ever been my lot to see it must have been full thirty feet high and its foliage exquisitely answered the iron railings such bijoux ne plus ultra replete with all the amenities do not as i pointed out to penfentenu transpire outside of england a hedge swinging sharp right flanked the garden and above it on a slope of daisy dotted meadows we could see lord lundy's tiled and half timbered summer farmhouse of a sudden we heard voices behind the tree the fine full tones of the unembarrassed english speaking to their equals that tore through the hedge like sleet through rafters that it is not called monkey puzzler for nothing i willingly concede this was a rich and rolling note but on the other hand i submit me lud, that the name implies that it might could would or should be ascended by a monkey and not that the ascent is a physical impossibility i believe one of our south american spider monkeys wouldn't hesitate by jove it might be worth trying if this was a crisper voice than the first a third higher pitched and full of pleasant affectations broke in oh practical men there is no ape here why do you waste one of god's own days on unprofitable discussion give me a match i've a good mind to make you demonstrate in your own person come on bubbles we'll make jimmy climb there was a sound of scuffling broken by squeaks from jimmy of the high voice i turned back and drew penfentenu into the side of the flanking hedge i remembered to have read in a society paper that lord lundy's lesser name was bubbles 
what are they doing penfentenu said sharply drunk just playing superabundant vitality of the race you know we'll watch him i answered the noise ceased my deliver jimmy gasped the ram caught in the thicket and i'm the only one who can talk neapolitan let go my collar he cried aloud in a foreign tongue and was answered from the gate it's the calvinistic organ grinder i whispered i had already found a practicable break at the bottom of the hedge they're going to try to make the monkey climb i believe here let me look penfentenu flung himself down and rooted till he too broke a peephole we lay side by side commanding the entire garden at ten yards range you know him said penfentenu as i made some noise or other by sight only the big fellow in flannels is lord lundy the light-built one with the yellow beard painted his picture at the last academy he's a swell r a james loman and the brown chap with the hands tomling sir christopher tomling the south american engineer who built the san juan viaduct i know said penfentenu we ought to have had him with us do you think a monkey would climb the tree the organ grinder at the gate fenced his beast with one arm as jimmy talked don't show off your futile accomplishments said lord lundy tell him it's an experiment interest him shut up bubbles you aren't in court jimmy replied this needs delicacy giuseppe says interest the monkey the brown engineer interrupted he won't climb for love cut up to the house and get some biscuits bubbles sugar ones and an orange or two no need to tell our women folk the huge white figure lobbed off at a trot which would not have disgraced a boy of seventeen i gathered from something jimmy let fall that the three had been at harrow together that tomling has a head on his shoulders muttered penfentenu pity we didn't get him for the colony but the question is will the monkey climb be quick jimmy tell the man we'll give him five bob for the loan of the beast now run the organ under the tree and we'll dress it when bubbles comes back sir christopher cried i've often wondered said penfentenu whether it would puzzle a monkey he had forgotten the needs of his nation and was earnestly parting the white thorn stems with his fingers giuseppe and jimmy did as they were told the monkey following them with a wary and malignant eye here's a discovery said jimmy the singing part of this organ comes off the wheels he spoke volubly to the proprietor oh it's so as giuseppe can take it to his room o nights and play it do you hear that the organ grinder after his day's crime plays his accursed machine for love for love chris and michael angelo was one of em don't jaw tell him to take the beast's petticoat off said sir christopher tomling lord lundy returned very little winded through a gap higher up the hedge they're all out thank goodness he cried but i've raided what i could marins glaces candied fruit and a bag of oranges excellent said the world-renowned contractor jimmy you're the light weight jump up on the organ and impale these things on the leaves as i hand em i see said jimmy capering like a spring buck upward and onward eh first he'll reach out for how infernal prickly these leaves are this biscuit next we'll lure him on that's about the reach of his arm with the marin glace and then he'll open out this orange how human how like your ignoble career bubbles with care and elaboration they ornamented that tree's lower branches with sugar-topped biscuits oranges bits of banana and marin's glaces till it looked very ape's path to paradise unchain the guy ascutis said sir christopher commandingly giuseppe placed the monkey atop of the organ where the beast misunderstanding stood on his head he's throwing himself on the mercy of the court my lud said jimmy no now he's interested now he's reaching after higher things what wouldn't i give to have here he mentioned a name not unhonoured in british art ambition plucking apples of sodom the monkey had pricked himself and was swearing genius hampered by convention oh there's a whole bushel full of allegories in it give him time he's balancing the probabilities said lord lundy the three closed round the monkey hanging on his every motion with an earnestness almost equal to ours the great judge's head seamed and vertical forehead iron mouth and pike-like under jaw all set on that thick neck rising out of the white flannel collar was thrown against the puckery green silk of the organ front as it might have been a cameo of titus jimmy with raised eyes and parted lips fingered his grizzled chestnut beard and i was near enough to note the capable beauty of his hands 
sir christopher stood a little apart his arms folded behind his back one heavy brown boot thrust forward chin in as curved and black eyebrows lowered to shade the keen eyes giuseppe's dark face between flashing earrings a twisted rag of red and yellow silk round his throat turned from the reaching yearning monkey to the pink and white biscuits spiked on the bronzed leafage and upon them all fell the serious and workmanlike sun of an english summer forenoon field de saint louis monte au ciel said lord lundy suddenly in a voice that made me think of black caps i do not know what the monkey thought because at that instant he leaped off the organ and disappeared there was a clash of broken glass behind the tree the monkey's face distorted with passion appeared at an upper window of the house and a starred hole in the stained-glass window to the left of the front door showed the first steps of his upward path we've got to catch him cried sir christopher come along they pushed at the door which was unlocked yes but consider the ethics of the case said jimmy isn't this burglary or something bubbles settle that when he's caught said sir christopher we're responsible for the beast a furious clanging of bells broke out of the empty house followed by muffed gurglings and trumpetings what the deuce is that i asked half aloud the plumbing of course said penfentenu what a pity i believe he'd have climbed if lord lundy hadn't put him off wait a moment chris said jimmy the interpreter giuseppe says he may answer to the music of his infancy giuseppe therefore will go in with the organ orpheus with his lute you know avante orpheus there's no neapolitan for bathroom but i fancy your friend is there i'm not going into another man's house with a hurdy-gurdy said lord lundy recoiling as giuseppe unshipped the working mechanism of the organ it developed a hang-down leg from its wheels slipped a strap round his shoulders and gave the handle a twist don't be a cad bubbles was jimmy's answer you couldn't leave us now if you were on the wool sack play orpheus the cadi accompanies with a whoop a buzz and a crash the organ sprang to life under the hand of giuseppe and the procession passed through the grain to imitate walnut front door a moment later we saw the monkey ramping on the roof he'll be all over the township in a minute if we don't head him said penfentenu leaping to his feet and crashing into the garden we headed him with pebbles till he retired through a window to the tuneful reminder that he had left a lot of little things behind him as we passed the front door it swung open and showed jimmy the artist sitting at the bottom of a newly cleaned staircase he waggled his hands at us and when we entered we saw that the man was stricken speechless his eyes grew red red like a ferret's and what little breath he had whistled shrilly at first we thought it was a fit and then we saw that it was mirth the inopportune mirth of the artistic temperament the house palpitated to an infamous melody punctuated by the stump of the barrel organ's one leg as giuseppe above moved from room to room after his rebel slave now and again a floor shook a little under the combined rushes of lord lundy and sir christopher tomling who gave many and contradictory orders but when they could they cursed jimmy with splendid thoroughness have you anything to do with the house panted jimmy at last because we're using it just now he gulped and i'm a keeping cave all right said penfentenu and shut the hall door jimmy you unspeakable blackguard jimmy you cur you coward lord lundy's voice overbore the flood of melody come up here giuseppe's saying something we don't understand jimmy listened and interpreted between hiccups he says you'd better play the organ bubbles and let him do the stalking the monkey knows him by jove he's quite right said sir christopher from the landing take it bubbles at once my god said lord lundy in horror the chase reverberated over our heads from the attics to the first floor and back again bodies and voices met in collision and argument and once or twice the organ hit walls and doors then it broke forth in a new manner he's playing it said jimmy i know his acute justinian ear are you fond of music i think lord lundy plays very well for a beginner i ventured ah that's the trained legal intellect like mastering a brief i haven't got it he wiped his eyes and shook hi said penfentenu looking through the stained-glass window down the garden what's that a household removals van in charge of four men had halted at the gate a husband and his wife householders beyond question quavered irresolutely up the path he looked tired she was certainly cross in all this haphazard world the last couple to understand a scientific experiment 
i laid hands on jimmy the clamour above drowning speech and with pen fen ten use aid propped him against the window that he should see he saw nodded fell as an umbrella can fall and kneeling beat his forehead on the shut door pen fen ten you slid the bolt the furniture men reinforced the two figures on the path and advanced spreading generously hadn't we better warn them upstairs i suggested no i'll die first said jimmy i'm pretty near it now besides they call me names i turned from the artist to the administrator ceteris paribus i think we'd better be going said pen fen ten you dealer in crises ta take me with you said jimmy i've no reputation to lose but i'd like to watch him from er outside the picture there's always a modus vivendi pen fen ten you murmured and tiptoed along the hall to a back door which he opened quite silently we passed into a tangle of gooseberry bushes where at his statesman-like example we crawled on all fours and regained the hedge here we lay up secure in our alibi but your firm the woman was wailing to the furniture removals men your firm promised me everything should be in yesterday and it's to-day you should have been here yesterday the last tenants ain't out yet lydy said one of them lord lundy was rapidly improving in technique though organ grinding unlike the law is more of a calling than a trade and he hung occasionally on a dead centre giuseppe i think was singing but i could not understand the drift of sir christopher's remarks they were spanish the woman said something we did not catch you might have sublet it the man insisted or your gentleman air might but i didn't send for the police at once i wouldn't do that lady they're only fruit pickers on a beano they aren't particular where they sleep you mean they've been sleeping there i only had it cleaned last week get them out oh if you say so we'll have em out of it in two twos alf fetch me the spare swingle bar don't you'll knock the paint off the door get them out what the hell else am i trying to do for you lady the man answered with pathos but the woman wheeled on her mate edward they're all drunk here and they're all mad there do something she said edward took one short step forward and sighed hello in the direction of the turbulent house the woman walked up and down the very figure of domestic tragedy the furniture men swayed a little on their heels and got him the shout rang through all the windows at once it was followed by a bloodhound-like bay from sir christopher a maniacal prestissimo on the organ and loud cries for jimmy but jimmy at my side rolled his congested eyeballs owlwise i never knew them he said i'm an orphan the front door opened and the three came forth to short-lived triumph i had never before seen a law lord dressed as for tennis with a stump-leg barrel organ strapped to his shoulder but it is a shy bird in this plumage lord lundy strove to disembarrass himself of his accoutrements much as an ill-trained punch and judy dog tries to escape backwards through his frill collar sir christopher covered with lime wash cherished a bleeding thumb and the almost crazy monkey tore at giuseppe's hair the men on both sides reeled but the woman stood her ground idiots she said and once more idiots i could have gladdened a few convicts of my acquaintance with a photograph of lord lundy at that instant madame he began wonderfully preserving the roll in his voice it was a monkey sir christopher sucked his thumb and nodded take it away and go she replied go away i would have gone and gladly on this permission but these still strong men must ever be justifying themselves lord lundy turned to the husband who for the first time spoke i have rented this house i am moving in he said we ought to have been in yesterday the woman interrupted yes we ought to have been in yesterday have you slept there overnight said the man peevishly no i assure you we haven't said lord lundy then go away go quite away cried the woman they went in single file down the path they went silently restrapping the organ on its wheels and rechaining the monkey to the organ damn it all said pen fentenu they do face the music and they do stick by each other in private life ties of common funk i answered giuseppe ran to the gate and fled back to the possible world lord lundy and sir christopher constrained by tradition paced slowly then it came to pass that the woman who walked behind them lifted up her eyes and beheld the tree which they had dressed stop she called and they stopped who did that there was no answer the eternal bad boy in every man hung its head before the eternal mother in every woman who put these disgusting things there she repeated suddenly pen fen ten you premier of his colony in all but name left jimmy and me and appeared at the gate if he is not turned out of office that is how he will appear on the day of armageddon 
well done you he cried zealously and doffed his hat to the woman have you any children madam he demanded yes too they should have been here to-day the firm promised then we're not a minute too soon that monkey escaped it was a very dangerous beast might have frightened your children into fits all the organ grinders fault a most lucky thing these gentlemen caught it when they did i hope you aren't badly mauled sir christopher shaken as i was i wanted to get away and laugh i could not but admire the scoundrel's consummate tact in leading his second highest trump an ass would have introduced lord lundy and they would not have believed him it took the trick the couple smiled and gave respectful thanks for their deliverance by such hands from such perils not in the least said lord lundy anybody any father would have done as much and pray don't apologize your mistake was quite natural a furniture man sniggered here and lord lundy rolled an eye of doom on their ranks by the way if you have trouble with these persons they seem to have taken as much as is good for them please let me know er good morning they turned into the lane heaven said jimmy brushing himself down who's that real man with the real head and we hurried after them for they were running unsteadily squeaking like rabbits as they ran we overtook them in a little nut wood half a mile up the road where they had turned aside and were rolling so we rolled with them and ceased not till we had arrived at the extremity of exhaustion you you saw it all then said lord lundy rebuttoning his nineteen-inch collar i saw it was a vital question from the first responded pen fen ten yu and blew his nose it was by the way do you mind telling me your name summa pen fen ten yu's great idea has gone through a little chipped at the edges but in fine and far-reaching shape his opposite number worked at it like a mule a bewildered mule beaten from behind coaxed from in front and propped on either soft side by lord lundy of the compressed mouth and the searing tongue sir christopher tomling has been ravished by the argentine where after all he was but preparing trade routes for hostile peoples and now adorns the forefront of pen fen tenu's advisory board this was an unforeseen extra as was jimmy's gratis full length it will be in the year's academy of pen fen tenu who has returned to his own place now and again from afar off between the slam and bump of his shifting scenery the glare of his manipulated limelight and the control rolling of his thunder drums i catch his voice lifted in encouragement and advice to his fellow-countrymen he is quite sound on ties of sentiment and alone of colonial statesmen ventures to talk of the ties of common funk herein i have my reward end of section eleven Section 12 of Actions and Reactions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Actions and Reactions by Rudyard Kipling. The Puzzler. Poem. The Celt, in all his variants, from Bilth to Ballyhoo, his mental processes are plain one knows what he will do and can logically predicate his finish by his start but the english ah the english they are quite a race apart their psychology is bovine their outlook crude and rare they abandon vital matters to be tickled with a straw but the straw that they were tickled with the chafe that they were fed with they convert into a weaver's beam to break their foeman's head with for undemocratic reasons and for motives not of state they arrive at their conclusions largely inarculate being void of self-expression they confide their views to none but sometimes in a smoking-room one learns why things are done in telegraphic sentences half swallowed at the ends they hint a matter's inwardness, and there the matter ends. And while the Celt is talking from Valencia to Kirkwall, the English, ah, the English, don't say anything at all. End of section 12. Recording by phone. Section 13 of Actions and Reactions this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Actions and Reactions by Rudyard Kipling. Little Foxes. 
A Tale of the Gihon Hunt A fox came out of his earth on the banks of the great river Gihon, which waters Ethiopia. He saw a white man riding through the dry Dura stalks, and that his destiny might be fulfilled, barked at him. The rider drew rein among the villagers round his stirrup. What said he is that? That, said the sheikh of the village, is a fox, O oh Excellency, our governor. It is not then a jackal? No jackal, but Abu Hussein, the father of cunning. Also, the white man spoke half aloud, I am Mudir of this province. It is true, they cried, Yasart el Mudir, O oh Excellency, our governor. The great river Gihon, well used to the moods of kings, slid between his mile-wide banks towards the sea, while the governor praised God in a loud and searching cry never before heard by the river. When he lowered his right forefinger from behind his right ear, the villagers talked to him of their crops, barley, dura, millet, onions, and the like. The governor stood in his stirrups. North he looked up a strip of green cultivation a few hundred yards wide that lay like a carpet between the river and the tawny line of the desert. Sixty miles that strip stretched before him and as many behind. At every half mile a groaning water wheel lifted the soft water from the river to the crops by way of a mud-built aqueduct. A foot or so wide was the water channel. Five foot or more high was the bank on which it ran, and its base was broad in proportion. Abu Hussein, misnamed the father of cunning, drank from the river below his earth, and a shadow was long in the low sun. He could not understand the loud cry which the governor had cried. The sheikh of the village spoke of the crops from which the rulers of all lands draw revenue, but the governor's eyes were fixed between his horse's ear on the nearest water channel. Very like a ditch in Ireland, he murmured and smiled, dreaming of a razor-topped bank in distant Kildare. Encouraged by that smile, the sheikh continued, When crops fail, it is necessary to remit taxation. Then it is a good thing, O oh Excellency, our governor, that you come and see the crops which have failed and discover that we have not lied. Assuredly, the governor shortened his reins. The horse cantered on, rose at the embankment of the water channel, changed leg cleverly on top, and hopped down in a cloud of golden dust. Abu Hussein from his earth watched with interest. He had never before seen such things. Assuredly, the governor repeated, and came back by the way he had gone. It is always best to see for oneself. An ancient and still bullet-speckled stern wheel steamer, with a barge lashed to her side, came round the river bend. She whistled to tell the governor his dinner was ready, and the horse, seeing his fodder piled on the barge, whinnied back. Moreover, the sheikh added, in the days of the oppression, the emirs and their creatures dispossessed many people of their lands. All up and down the river, our people are waiting to return to their lawful fields. Judges have been appointed to settle that matter, said the governor. They will presently come in steamers and hear the witnesses. Wherefore did the judges kill the emirs? We would rather be judged by the men who executed God's judgment on the emirs. We would rather abide by your decision, O Excellency, our governor. The governor nodded. It was a year since he had seen the emirs stretch clothes and still round the reddened sheepskin where lay El Amadi, the prophet of God. Now there remained no trace of their dominion except the old steamer, once part of a dervish flotilla, which was his house and office. She sidled into the shore, lowered a plank, and the governor followed his horse aboard. Lights burned on her till late, duly reflected in the river that tugged at her mooring ropes. The governor read, not for the first time, the administration reports of one John Jorick's M.F.H., we shall need, he said suddenly to his inspector, about ten couple. I'll get em when I go home. You'll be whip, Baker? The inspector, who was not yet twenty-five, signified his assent in the usual manner, while Abu Hussein barked at the vast desert moon. Ha! said the governor, coming out in his pajamas. We'll be giving you kepivi in another month, my friend. 
It was four, as a matter of fact, ere a steamer with melodious barge full of hounds anchored at that landing. The inspector leaped down among them, and the homesick wanderers received him as a brother. Everybody fed him everything on board ship, but there are real dainty hounds at bottom, the governor explained. That's royal you've got hold of, the pick of the bunch, and the bitch that's got hold of you, she's a little excited, is May Queen Merriman, out of Coatsman Maudlin, you know. I know. Grand old betch with the tan eyebrows, the inspector cooed. Oh, Ben, I shall take an interest in life now. Hark to him. Oh, hark. Abu Hussein, under the high bank, went about his night's work, and Eddie carried his scent to the barge, and three villagers heard the crash of music that followed. Even then, Abu Hussein did not know better than to bark in reply. Well, what about my province? the governor asked. Not so bad, the inspector answered, with Royal's head between his knees. Of course, all the villages want remission of taxes, but as far as I can see, the whole country is stinking with foxes. Our trouble will be chomping him in cover. I've got a list of the only villages entitled to any remission. What do you call this flat-sided, blue-mottled beast with the jowl? Beagle Boy. I have my doubts about him. Do you think we can get two days a week? Easy and as many buys as you please. The shake of this village here tells me that his barley has failed and he wants a 50% remission. We'll begin with him tomorrow and look at his crops as we go. Nothing like personal supervision, said the governor. They began at sunrise. The pack flew up the barge in every direction and after gambles dug like terriers at Abu Hussein's many earths. Then they drank themselves pot-bellied on Gihon River, while the governor and the inspector chastised them with whips. Scorpions were added, for May Queen nosed one, and was removed to the barge lamenting. Mystery, a puppy alas, met a snake, and the blue-mottled beagle boy, never a dainty hound, ate that which he should have passed by. Only royal of the Belwar, Tanhead, and the sad discerning eyes made any attempt to uphold the honor of England before the watching village. You can't expect everything, said the governor after breakfast. We got it, though, everything except foxes. Have you seen May Queen's nose, said the inspector. And mystery's dead. We'll keep them coupled next time till we get well in among the crops. I say, what a babbling body snatcher that beagle boy is. Ought to be drowned. They worry people so damn casual hereabouts. Give him another chance, the inspector pleaded, not knowing that he should live to repent most bitterly. Talking of chances, said the governor, this sheikh lies about his barley being a failure. If it's high enough to hide a hound at this time of the year, it's all right. And he wants a 50% remission, you said? You didn't go on past the melon patch where I tried to turn wanderer. It's all burnt up from there onto the desert. His other water wheel has broken down too, the inspector replied. Very good. We'll split the difference and allow him 25% off. Where will we meet him tomorrow? There's some trouble among the villages down the river about their land titles. It's going good ground there, too, the inspector said. The next meet, then, was some 20 miles down the river, and the pack were not enlarged till they were fairly among the fields. Abu Hussein was there in force, four of them, four delirious hunts of four minutes each, Four hounds per fox ended in four earths just above the river. All the village looked on. We forgot about the earths. The banks are riddled with them. This'll defeat us, said the inspector. Wait a moment. The governor drew forth the sneezing hound. I've just remembered. I'm governor of these parts. Then turn out a black battalion to stop for us. We'll need him, old man. The governor straightened his back. Give ear, O people, he cried. I make a new law. The villagers closed in. He called. Henceforth, I will give one dollar to the man on whose land Abu Hussein is found, and another dollar, he held up the coin, to the man on whose land these dogs shall kill him. But to the man on whose land Abu Hussein shall run into a hole, such as is this hole, I will give not dollars, but a most unmeasurable beating. Is it understood? Oh, Excellency, a man stepped forward. On my land, Abu Hussein was found this morning. Is it not so, brothers? None denied. The governor tossed him over four dollars without a word. On my land, they all went into their holes, cried another, therefore I must be beaten. Not so. The land is mine, and mine are the beatings. The second speaker thrust forward his shoulders already bared, and the villagers shouted, Hello, two men anxious to be licked? 
There must be some swindle about the land, said the governor. Then, in local vernacular, what are your rights to the beating? As a river reach changes beneath a slant of the sun, that which has been a scattered mob changed to a court of most ancient justice. The hounds tore and sobbed at Abu Hussain's hearthstone, all unnoticed among the legs of the witnesses, and Gihon, also accustomed to laws, purred approval. You will not wait till the judges come up the river to settle the dispute, said Governor at last. No, shouted all the village, save the man who had first asked to be beaten. We will abide by our Excellency's decision. Let our Excellency turn out the creatures of the emirs who stole our lands in the days of the oppression. And thou sayest, the governor turned to the man who had first asked to be beaten, I say I will wait till the wise judges come down in the steamer, then I will bring my many witnesses, he replied. He is rich, he will bring many witnesses, the village sheikh muttered. No need, thy own mouth condemns thee, the governor cried. No man lawfully entitled to his land would wait one hour before entering upon it. Stand aside. The man fell back and the village jeered him. The second claimant stooped quickly beneath the lifted hunting crop. The village rejoiced. Oh, such a one, son of such an one, said the governor, prompted by the sheikh. Learn from the day when I send the order to block up all the holes where Abu Hussein may hide on thy land. The light flicks end. The man stood up triumphant. By that accolade had the supreme government acknowledged his title before all men. While the village praised the perspicacity of the governor, a naked pock-marked child stood forth to the earth and stood on one leg, unconcerned as a young stork. Hal, he said, hands behind his back, this should be blocked up with bundles of durastalks or better bundles of thorns. Better thorns, said the governor, thick ends innermost. The child nodded gravely and squatted on the sand. An evil day for thee, Abu Hussein, he shrilled into the mouth of the earth. A day of obstacles to thy flagitious returns in the morning. Who is it? the governor asked the sheikh. It thinks. Farag the fatherless. His people were slain in the days of the oppression. The man to whom Our Excellency has awarded the land is, as it were, his maternal uncle. Will it come with me and feed the big dogs? said the governor. The other peering children drew back. Run, they cried. Our Excellency will feed Farag to the big dogs. I will come, said Farag, and I will never go. He threw his arm round Royal's neck, and the wise beast licked his face. Benjamin, by Jove, the inspector cried. No, said the governor, I believe he has the makings of a James pig. Farag waved his hand to his uncle and led Royal on to the barge. The rest of the pack followed. Gihon, that had seen many sports, learned to know the hunt barge well. He met her rounding his bends on a grey December dawns to music wild and lamentable as the almost forgotten throb of dervish drums, when high above the royal's tenor bell, sharper even than lying beagle's boys' falsetto break, Farag chanted deathless war against Abu Hussein and all his seed. At sunrise, the river would shoulder her carefully into her place and listen to the rush and scutter of the pack, fleeing up the gangplank and the tramp of the governor's Arab behind them. They would pass over the brow into the dewless crops where Gihon, low and shrunken, could only guess what they were about when Abu Hussein flew down the bank to scratch at the stopped earth and flew back into the barley again. As Farag had foretold, it was evil days for Abu Hussein ere he learned to take the necessary steps and to get away crisply. Sometimes Gihon saw the whole procession of the hunt silhouetted against the morning blue, bearing him company for many merry miles. At every half mile, the horses and the donkeys jumped the water channels up on changer leg and off again like figures in Zotrope, till they grew small among the line of water wheels. Then Gibbon waited their rustling return through the crops and took them to rest on his bosom at ten o'clock. While the horses ate and Farag slept with his head on royal flank, the governor and his inspector worked for the good of the hunt and his province. After a little time, there was no need to beat any man for neglecting his earths. The steamer's destination was telegraphed from water wheel to water wheel, and the villagers stopped out and put to according. 
if an earth were overlooked, it meant some dispute as to the ownership of the land, and then and there the hunt checked and settled it in this wise. The governor and the inspector side by side, but the latter half a horse's length to the rear. Both bare-shouldered claimants well in front, the villagers half-moon behind them, and Farag with the pack, who quite understood the performance, sitting down on the left. Twenty minutes were enough to settle the most complicated case, for, as the governor said to the judge on the steamer, one gets at the truth in a hunting field a heap quicker than in your law courts. But when the evidence is conflicting, the judge suggested, wash the field. They'll throw tongue fast enough if you're running a wrong scent. You've never had an appeal from one of my decisions yet. The sheikhs on horseback, the lesser folk on clever donkeys, the children so despised by Farag soon understood that villages which repaired their water wheels and channels stood highest in the governor's favor. He bought their barley for his horses. Channels, he said, are necessary that we may all jump them. They are necessary, moreover, for the crops. Let there be many wheels and sound channels and much good barley. Without money, replied an aged sheikh, there are no water wheels. I will lend the money, said governor. At what interest, O oh, Our Excellency? Take you two of May Queen's puppies to bring up in your village in such a manner that yet they do not eat filth, nor lose their hair, nor catch fever from lying in the sun, but become wise hounds. Like Royale, not like Biggleby. Already it was an insult along the river to compare a man to the shifty anthropophagus, blue-modeled harrier. Certainly like Royale, not in the least like Biggleby. That shall be on the interest on the loan. Let the puppies thrive, and the water wheel be built, and I shall be content, said the governor. The wheel shall be built, but, O oh, Our Excellency, if our gods favor the pups, grow to be well smelters, not filth eaters, not unaccustomed to their names, not lawless, who will do them and me justice at the time of judging the young dogs? Hounds, man, hounds, hawans, O oh, sheikh, we call them in their manhood. The hawans, when they judged, are at the shaho. I have unfriends down the river to whom our excellency has also entrusted Hawans to bring up. Puppies, man, puppies. We shall call them O Sheikh in their childhood. Papit. My enemies may judge my puppies unjustly at the Shaho. This must be thought of. I see the obstacle. Here now, if the new water wheel is built in a month without oppression, thou O Sheikh, shall be named one of the judges to judge the puppies at the Shaho. Is it understood? Understood. We will build the wheel. I and my seed are responsible for the payment of the loan. Where are my puppies? If they eat fowl, must they on any account eat the feathers? On no account must they eat the feathers. Farag and the barge will tell thee how they are to live. There is no instance of any default in the governor's personal and unauthorized loans for which they call him the father of water wheels. But the first puppy show at the capital needed enormous tact, and the presence of a black battalion stentatiously drilling in the barrack square to prevent trouble after the price giving. But who can chronicle the glories of the Gihon hunt or their shames? Who remembers the kill in the marketplace when the governor bade the assembled sheikhs and warriors observe how the hounds would instantly devour the body of Abu Hussein, but how, when he had scientifically broken it up, the weary pack turned from it in loathing, and Farag wept because he said the world's face had been blackened. What men who have not yet ridden beyond the sound of any horn recall the midnight run, which ended? Beagle Boy leading, among tombs, the hasty whip-off and the oath taken a bow a bone to forget the worries. The desert run when Abu Hussein forsook the cultivation and made a six-mile point to earth in a desolate core, when strange armed riders on camels swooped out of a ravine and, instead of giving battle, offered to take the tired hounds home on their beasts, which they did, and vanished. Above all, who remembers the death of Royal, when a certain sheikh wept above the body of stainless hound, as it might have been his son's, and that day the hunt rode no more. The badly kept logbook says little of this, but at the end of their second season, 49 Brace, appears the dark entry, new blood badly wanted. They are beginning to listen to Beagle Boy. The inspector attended to the matter when his leave fell due. 
Remember, said the governor, you must get us the best blood in England. Real dainty hounds. Expense no object, but don't trust your own judgment. Present my letters of introduction and take what they give you. The inspector presented his letters in a society where they make much of horses, more of hounds, and are tolerably civil to men who can ride. They passed him from house to house, mounted him according to his merits, and fed him, after years of goat chop and Worcester sauce, perhaps a thought too richly. The seat or castles where he made his great coup does not much matter. Four masters of fox hounds were at table, and in a mellow hour, the inspector told them stories of the Gihon hunt. He ended, Ben said I wasn't to trust my own judgment about hounds, but I think there ought to be a special tariff for empire makers. As soon as his host could speak, they reassured him on this point. And now tell us about your first puppy show all over again, said one. And about the earth stopping. Was that all Ben's own invention, said another? Wait a moment, said a large, clean-shaven man, not an MFH, at the end of the table. Are your villagers habitually beaten by your governor when they fail to stop foxes' holes? The tone and the phrase were enough, even if, as the inspector confessed afterwards, the big, blue, double-chinned man had not looked so like Beagle Boy. He took him on for the honor of Ethiopia. We only had twice a week, sometimes three times. I have never known a man chastised more than four times a week unless there is a buy. The large, loose-lipped man flung his napkin down, came around the table and cast himself into a chair next to the inspector and leaned forward earnestly so that he breathed in the inspector's face. Chastised with what, he said, with the corbash on the feet. A corbash is a strip of old hippo hide with a sort of keel on it, like the cutting edge of a boar's tusk. But we use the rounded side for a first offender. And do any consequences follow this sort of thing? For the victim, I mean, not for you. Very rarely. Let me be fair. I have never seen a man die under the lash, but gangrene may set up if the corbash has been pickled. Pickled and what? All the table was still and interested. In Copperas, of course. Didn't you know that, said the inspector? Thank God I didn't. The large man sputtered visibly. The inspector wiped his face and grew bolder. You mustn't think we're careless about our earth stoppers. We have a hunt fund for hot tar. Tar's a splendid dressing if the toenails aren't beaten off. But hunting as large a country as we do, we may be back at the village for a month. And if the dressings ain't renewed and gangrene sets in, often as not, you find your man pegging about on his stumps. We have a well-known local name for him down the river. We call him the Mudir's Cranes. You see, I persuaded the governor only to bastinado on one foot. On one foot? The Mudir's Crane? The large man turned purple to the top of his bald head. Would you mind giving me the local word for Mudir's Cranes? From a too well-stocked memory, the inspector drew one short, adhesive word, which surprises by itself even unblushing Ethiopia. He spelt it out, saw the large man write it down on his cuff, and withdraw. Then the inspector translated a few of its significations and implications to the four masters of foxhounds. He left three days later with eight couple of the best hounds in England, a free and a friendly, and an ample gift from four packs to the Gihon hunt. He had honestly meant to undeceive the large blue mottled man, but somehow forgot about it. The new draft marks a new chapter in the hunt's history. From an isolated phenomena in a barge, it became a permanent institution with brick-built kennels ashore and an influence social, political, and administrative could terminus with the boundaries of province. Then the governor departed to England, where he kept a pack of real dainty hounds, but never ceased to log for the old lawless lot. His successors were ex officio masters of the Gihon hunt, as all inspectors were whips. For one reason, Farag, the kennel huntsman, and Khaki and Putties would obey nothing under the rank of an excellency, and the hounds would obey no one but Farag. For another, the best way of estimating crop returns and revenues was by riding straight to hounds. For a third, 
though judges down the river issued signed and sealed land titles to all lawful owners, yet public opinion along the river never held any such title valid till it had been confirmed, according to the precedent, by the governor's hunting crop in the hunting field above the willfully neglected earth. True, the ceremony had been cut down to three mere taps on the shoulder, but governors who tried to evade that much found themselves and their office compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses who took up their time with lawsuits and worse still neglected the puppies. The older sheikhs indeed stood out for the unmeasurable beatings of the old days. The sharper the punishment, they argued, the surer the title. But here the land of modern progress was against them, and they contented themselves with telling tales of Ben the first governor, whom they called the father of water wheels, and of that heroic age when men, horses, and hounds were worth following. This same modern progress which brought dog biscuits and brass water taps to the kennels was at work all over the world. Forces, activities, and movements sprang into being, agitated themselves, coalesced, and in one political avalanche overwhelmed a bewildered and not in the least intending it England. The echoes of the new era were borne into the province on the wings of inexplicable cables. The Gihon hunt read speeches and sentiments and policies which amazed them, and they thanked God prematurely that their province was too far off too hot and too hard worked to be reached by those speakers or their policies but they with others underestimated the scope and purpose of the new era one by one the provinces of the empire were hauled up and baited hit and held lashed under the belly and forced back on their haunches for the amusement of their new masters in the parish of westminster one by one they fell away sore and angry to compare stripes with each other at the end of the uneasy earth. Even so, the Gihon hunt, like Abu Hussein in the old days, did not understand. Then it reached them through the press that they habitually flogged to death good revenue-paying cultivators who neglected to stop earths, but that the few, the very few who did not die under hippo-hide whips soaked in copperas, walked about on their gangrenous ankle bones and were known in derision as the Mudir's cranes. The charges were vouched for in the House of Commons by Mr. Lethabi Groombride, who had formed a committee and was disseminating literature. The province groaned. The inspector, now an inspector of inspectors, whistled. He had forgotten the gentleman who sputtered in people's faces. He shouldn't have looked so like Beagleboy, was his sole defense when he met the governor at breakfast on the steamer after a meet. You shouldn't have joked with an animal of that class, said Peter the governor. Look what Farag has brought me. It was a pamphlet signed on behalf of a committee by a lady secretary, but composed by some person who thoroughly understood the language of the province. After telling the tale of the beatings, it recommended all the beaten to institute criminal proceedings against their governor, and as soon as might be to rise against English oppression and tyranny. Such documents were new in Ethiopia in those days. The inspector read the last half page. But, but, he stammered, this is impossible. White men don't write this sort of stuff. Don't they just, said the governor. They get made cabinet ministers for doing it, too. I went home last year, I know. It'll blow over, said the inspector weakly. Not it. Groombright is coming down here to investigate the matter in a few days. For himself? The imperial government's behind him. Perhaps you would like to look at my orders? The governor laid down an uncoated cable. The whiplash to it ran. You will afford Mr. Groombright every facility for his inquiry and will be held responsible that no obstacles are put in his way to the fullest possible examination of any witnesses which he may consider necessary. He will be accompanied by his own interpreter who must not be tampered with. That's to me, governor of the province, said Peter the governor. It seems about enough, the inspector answered. Farag Kennel Huntsman entered the saloon as was his privilege. My uncle, who was beaten by the father of water wheels, would approach, O oh, Excellency, he said, and there are others on the bank. 
admit, said the governor. There trampled a porridge shakes and villagers to the number of seventeen. In each man's hand was a copy of the pamphlet, in each man's eye terror and uneasiness of the sort that governors spend and are spent to clear away. Farag's uncle, now sheikh of the village, spoke. It is written in this book, Excellency, that the beatings whereby we hold our lands are all valueless. It is written that every man who receives such a beating from the father of water wheels who slow the mirrors should instantly begin a lawsuit because the title to his land is still valid. It is so written. We do not wish lawsuits. We wish to hold the land as it was given to us after the days of the oppression, they cried. The governor glanced at the inspector. This was serious. To cast doubt on the ownership of the land means, in Ethiopia, the letting in of waters and the getting out of troops. Your titles are good, said the governor. The inspector confirmed with a nod. Then what is the meaning of these writings which came from down the river where the judges are? Farag's uncle waved his copy. By whose order are we ordered to slay you, O Excellency, our governor? It is not written that you are to slay me. Not in those very words, but we leave an earth unstopped. It is the same as though we wish to save Abu Hussein from the hounds. These writings say, abolish your rulers. How can we abolish except we kill? We hear rumors of one who comes from down the river soon to lead us to kill. Fools, said the governor, your titles are good. This is madness. It is so written, they answered like a pack. Listen, said the inspector smoothly. I know who caused the writings to be written and sent. He is a man of blue mottled jowls, in aspect like Bigelby, who ate unclean matters. He will come up the river and will give tongue about the beatings. Will he impeach our land titles? An evil day for him? Go slow, Baker, the governor whispered. They'll kill him if they get scared about their land. I tell a parable. The inspector lit a cigarette. Declare which of you took to walk the children of Milkmaid. Milkmaid first or second, said Farag quickly. The second, the one which was lamed by the thorn. No, no, Melik made the second, strained her shoulder, leaping my water channel. A sheikh cried. Melik made the first was lamed by the thorns on the day when our excellency fell thrice. True, true, the second Melik made's mate was Malvolio, the pied hound, said the inspector. I had two of the second Melik made's pups, said Farag's uncle. They died of madness in their ninth month. And how did they do before they died, said the inspector. They ran about in the sun and slavered in the mouth till they died. Wherefore? God knows he sent the madness. It was no fault of mine. Thy own mouth had answered thee, the inspector laughed. It is with men as it is with dogs. God afflicts some with a madness. It is no fault of ours if such men run about in the sun and froth at the mouth. The man who is coming will emit spray from his mouth in speaking, and will always edge and push in towards his hearers. When you see him and hear him, you will understand that he is afflicted of God, being mad. He is in God's hands. But our titles, are our titles to our lands good? The crowd repeated. Your titles are in my hands. They are good, said the governor. And he who wrote the writings is an afflicted of God, said Farag's uncle. The inspector had said it, cried the governor. You'll see when the man comes, O oh, shakes and men. Have we ridden together and walked puppies together and bought and sold barley for the horses that after these years we should run riot on the scent of a madman, an afflicted of God? But the hunt pays us to kill mad jackals, said Farag's uncle, and he who questions my titles to my land. Ah, we're a riot, the governor's hunting crop cracked like a three-pounder. By Allah, he thundered, if the afflicted of God come to any harm at your hands, I myself will shoot every hound and every puppy, and the hunt shall ride no more. On your heads be it, go in peace and tell the others. The hunt shall ride no more, said Farag's uncle, then how can the land be governed? No, no, O Excellency, our governor, we will not harm a hair on the head of the afflicted of God. He shall be to us, as is Abu Hussein's wife in the breeding season. When they were gone, the governor mopped his forehead. We must put a few soldiers in every village this groom bride visits, Baker. Tell him to keep out of sight and have an eye on the villagers. He's trying him rather high. O Excellency, said the smooth voice of Farag, laying the field and country life square on the table. If the afflicted of God, who resembles Biggle by one with the man whom the inspector met in the great house in England, and to whom he told the tale of the Mudir's crane? The same man, Farag, said the inspector. 
I have often heard the inspector tell the tale to Our Excellency at feeding time in the kennels, but since I am in the government service, I have never told it to my people. May I lose that tale among the villagers? The governor nodded. No harm, said he. The details of Mr. Groombride's arrival with his interpreter, whom he proposed should eat with him at the governor's table, his allocution to the governor on the new movement, and the sins of imperialism I purposely omit. At three in the afternoon, Mr. Groombride said, I will go out now and address your victims in this village. Won't you find it rather hot, said the governor? They generally take a nap at sunset at this time of the year. Mr. Groombride's large, loose lips set. That, he replied pointedly, would be enough to decide me. I fear you have not quite mastered your instructions. May I ask you to send for my interpreter? I hope he has not been tampered with by your subordinates. He was a yellowish boy called Abdul, who had well eaten and drunk with Farag. The inspector, by the way, was not present at the meal. At whatever risk, I shall go unattended, said Mr. Groombride. Your presence would cow them from giving evidence. Abdul, my good friend, would you very kindly open the umbrella? He passed up the gangplank to the village, and with no more prelude than a Salvation Army picket and a Portsmouth slum cried, Oh, my brothers! He did not guess how his path had been prepared. The village was widely awake. Farag in loose flowing garments, quite unlike Kennel's huntsman's cocky and putties, leaned against the wall of his uncle's house. Come and see the afflicted god, he cried musically, whose face indeed resembles that of Bickleby. The village came and decided that on the whole, Farag was right. I can't quite catch what they're saying, said Mr. Groomsbride. They're saying they very much pleased to see you, sir, Abdul interpreted. Then I do think they might have sent a deputation to the steamer, but I suppose they were frightened of the officials. Tell them not to be frightened, Abdul. He says you are not to be frightened, Abdul explained. A child here spluttered with laughter. Refrain from mirth, Farag cried. The afflicted of God is the guest of the Excellency, our governor. We are responsible for every hair of his head. He has none, a voice spoke. He has the white and shining mange. Now tell them what I have come for, Abdul, and please keep the umbrella well up. I think I shall reserve myself for my little vernacular speech at the end. Approach, look, listen, Abdul chanted. The afflicted of God will now make sport. Presently he will speak in your tongue and will consume you with mirth. I have been his servant for three weeks. I will tell you about his undergarments and his perfumes for his head. He told them at length. And didst thou take any of his perfume bottles? said Farag at the end. I am his servant. I took two, Abdul replied. Ask him, said Farag's uncle, what he knows about our land titles. Ye young men are all alike. He waved the pamphlet. Mr. Groom's bride smiled to see how the seed sown in London had borne fruit by Gihon. Lo, all the seniors held copies of the pamphlet. He knows less than a buffalo. He told me on the steamer that he was driven out of his own land by Demakarazi, which is a devil inhabiting crowds and assemblies, said Abdul. Allah between us and evil, a woman cackled from the darkness of a hut. Come in, children, he may have the evil eye. No, my aunt, said Farag, no afflicted of God has an evil eye. Wait till you hear his mirth-provoking speech which he will deliver. I have heard it twice from Abdul. They seem very quick to grasp the point. How far have you got, Abdul? All about the beating, sir. They're highly interested. Don't forget about the local self-government. And please, hold umbrella over me. It is hopeless to destroy unless one first builds up. He may not have the evil eye, Farag's uncle grunted. But his devil led him too certainly to question my land title. Ask him whether he still doubts my land title. Or mine, or mine, cried the elders. What odds? He is an afflicted of God, Farag called. Remember the tale I told you? Yes, but he is an Englishman, and doubtless of influence, or Our Excellency would not entertain him. Bid the down-country jackass ask him. Sir, said Abdul, these people, much fearing they may be turned out of their land, in consequence of your remarks. Therefore they ask you to make promise no bad consequences following your visit. Mr. Groombride held his breath and turned purple. Then he stamped his foot. Tell them, he cried, that if a hair of any one of their heads is touched by an official, on any account, whatever, all England shall ring with it. 
Good God, what callous oppression! The dark places of the earth are full of cruelty. He wiped his face and, throwing out his arms, cried, Tell them, oh, tell the poor serfs not to be afraid of me. Tell them I come to redress their wrongs, not heaven knows to add to their burden. The long-drawn gurgle of the practiced public speaker pleased them much. That is how the new water tap runs out in the kennel, said Frog. The Excellency, our governor, entertains him that he may make sport. Make him say the mirth-moving speech. What did he say about my land titles? Frog's uncle was not to be turned. He says, Frog interpreted, that he desires nothing better than you should live on your lands in peace. He talks as though he believed himself to be governor. Well, we here are all witnesses to what he has said. Now go forward with the sport. Frog's uncle smoothed his garments. How diversely had Allah made his creatures. On one he bestows strength to slay mirrors, another he causes to go mad and wander in the sun like the afflicted sons of Melek Maid. Yes, and to emit spray from the mouth, as the inspector told us. All will happen as the inspector foretold, said Farag. I've never yet seen the inspector thrown out during any run. I think Abdul plucked at Mr. Groom's bride's sleeves. I think perhaps it is better now, sir, if you give your fine little native speech. They, not understanding English, but much pleased at your condescensions. Condescensions, Mr. Groombride spun around, if they only knew how I felt towards them in my heart, if I could express a tithe of my feelings, I must stay here and learn the language. Hold up the umbrella, Abdul, I think my little speech will show them I know something of their valiant time. It was a short, simple, carefully learned address, and the accent, supervised by Abdul on the steamer, allowed the hearers to guess its meaning, which was a request to see one of the Madeir's cranes, since the desire of the speaker's life, the object to which he would consecrate his days, was to improve the condition of the Madeir's cranes. But first he must behold them with his own eyes. Would then his brethren, whom he loved, show him a Madeir's crane, whom he desired to love? Once, twice, and again in his preparation, he repeated his demand, using always that they might see he was acquainted with their local argot, using always, I say, the word which the inspector had given him in England long ago, the short, adhesive word which by itself surprises even unblushing Ethiopia. There are limits to the sublime politeness of an ancient people. A bulky, blue-chinned man in white clothes, his name red-lettered across his lower shirt-front, spluttering from under a green line umbrella, almost tearful appeals to be introduced to the unintroducible, naming loudly the unnameable, dancing as it seemed in perverse joy at merry mention of the unmentionable, found those limits. There was a moment's hush, and then such mirth as Kihon through his centuries had never heard, a roar like the roar of his own cataracts and flood. Children cast themselves on the ground, and rolled back and forth, cheering and whooping. Strong men, their faces hid in their clothes, swayed and silenced, till the agony became unsupportable, and they threw up their hands and bayed at the sun. Women, mothers, and virgins shrilled shriek upon mounting, tried to draw breath, some half-strangled voice would quack out the word, and the riot began afresh. Last to fall was the city-trained Abdul. He held on to the edge of apoplexy, then collapsed, throwing an umbrella from him. Mr. Groombread should not be judged too harshly. Exercise and strong emotion under a hot sun, the shock of public ingratitude for the moment ruined his spirit. He furled the umbrella, and with it beat the prostrate Abdul, crying that he had been betrayed in which posture the inspector on horseback followed by the governor suddenly found him that's all very well said the inspector when he had taken abdul's dramatically dying depositions on the steamer but you can't hammer a native merely because he laughs at you i see nothing for it but the law to take its course you might reduce the charge to a uh, tampering with an interpreter said the governor mr groombride was far too gone to be comforted it's the publicity that i fear he wailed is there no possible means of hushing up the affair? You don't know what a question, a single question in the house, means to a man of my position. The ruin of my political career, I assure you. I shouldn't have imagined it, said the governor thoughtfully. And though perhaps I ought not to say it, I am not without honor in my own country or influence. A word in season, as you know, Your Excellency, it might carry an official far. The governor shuddered. Yes, that had to come too, he said to himself. Well, look here. If I tell this man of yours to withdraw the charge against you, you can go to Gehenna for aught I care. The only condition I make is that if you write, I suppose that's part of your business about your travels, you don't praise me. So far, Mr. Groombride has loyally adhered to this understanding. End of section 13
Section 14 of Actions and Reactions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Cornel Nemesh in Reno, Nevada Actions and Reactions by Rudyard Kipling Gallio's Song All day long to the judgment seat The crazed provincials drew All day long at their ruler's feet howled for the blood of the Jew. Insurrection with one accord banded itself and woke. And Paul was about to open his mouth when Achaia's deputy spoke. Whether the God descend from above or the man ascend upon high, whether this maker of tents be Jove or a younger deity, I will be no judge between your gods and your godless bickerings. Lictor, drive them hence with rods. I care for none of these things. Where is the question of lawful due or a laborer's hire denied, a reason would I should bear with you and order it well to be tried, but this is a question of words and names, and I know the strife it brings. I will not pass upon any your claims. I care for none of these things. One thing only I see most clear, as I pray you also see. Claudius Caesar had set me here, Rome's deputy to be. It is her peace that ye go to break, not mine nor any king's, but touching your clamor of conscience' sake, I care for none of these things. End of section 14 Recording by Cornel Nemesh in Reno, Nevada Section 15 of Actions and Reactions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Actions and Reactions by Rudyard Kipling. The House Surgeon. On an evening after Easter Day, I sat at a table in a homeward bound steamer's smoking room where half a dozen of us told ghost stories. As our party broke up, a man, playing patience in the next alcove, said to me, I didn't quite catch the end of that last story about the curse on the family's firstborn. It turned out to be drains, I explained. As soon as new ones were put into the house, the curse was lifted, I believe. I never knew the people myself. Ah, I've had my drains up twice. I'm on gravel, too. You don't mean to say you've a ghost in your house. Why didn't you join our party? any more orders gentlemen before the bar closes the steward interrupted sit down again and have one with me said the patience player no it isn't a ghost our trouble is more depression than anything else how interesting then it's nothing any one can see it's it's nothing worse than a little depression and the odd part is that there hasn't been a death in the house since it was built in eighteen sixty three the lawyer said so that decided me my good lady rather and he made me pay an extra thousand for it how curious unusual too i said yes ain't it it was built for three sisters moultrie was the name 
three old maids they all lived together the eldest owned it i bought it from her lawyer a few years ago and if i've spent a pound on the place first and last i must have spent five thousand electric light new servants wing garden all that sort of thing a man and his family ought to be happy after so much expense ain't it he looked at me through the bottom of his glass does it affect your family much my good lady she's a greek by the way and myself are middle-aged we can bear up against depression but it's hard on my little girl i say little but she's twenty we send her visiting to escape it she almost lived at hotels and hydros last year but that isn't pleasant for her she used to be a canary a perfect canary always singing you ought to hear her she doesn't sing now that sort of thing's unwholesome for the young ain't it can't you get rid of the place i suggested not except at a sacrifice and we're fond of it just suits us three we'd love it if we were allowed what do you mean by not being allowed i mean because of the depression it spoils everything what's it like exactly i couldn't very well explain it must be seen to be appreciated as the auctioneers say now i was much impressed by the story you were telling just now it wasn't true i said my tale is true if you would do me the pleasure to come down and spend a night at my little place you'd learn more than you would if i talked till morning very likely twouldn't touch your good self at all you might be immune ain't it on the other hand if this influenza influence does happen to affect you why i think it will be an experience while he talked he gave me his card and i read his name was l maxwell Mallard, esq of holmescroft a city address was tucked away in a corner my business he added used to be furs if you are interested in furs i've given thirty years of my life to em you're very kind i murmured far from it i assure you i can meet you next saturday afternoon anywhere in london you choose to name and i'll be only too happy to motor you down it ought to be a delightful run at this time of year the rhododendrons will be out i mean it you don't know how truly i mean it very probably it won't affect you at all and i think i may say i have the finest collection of narwhal tusks in the world all the best skins and horns have to go through london and l maxwell mallard he knows where they come from and where they go to that's his business for the rest of the voyage up channel mr mallard talked to me of the assembling preparation and sale of the rarer furs and told me things about the manufacture of fur-lined coats which quite shocked me somehow or other when we landed on wednesday i found myself pledged to spend that weekend with him at holmescroft on saturday he met me with a well-groomed motor and ran me out in an hour and a half to an exclusive residential district of dustless roads and elegantly designed country villas each standing in from three to five acres of perfectly appointed land he told me land was selling at eight hundred pounds the acre and the new golf links whose queen and pavilion we passed had cost nearly twenty four thousand pounds to create holmescroft was a large two-storied low creeper-covered residence a veranda at the south side gave on to a garden and two tennis courts separated by a tasteful iron fence from a most park-like meadow of five or six acres where two jersey cows grazed tea was ready in the shade of a promising copper beech and i could see groups on the lawn of young men and maidens appropriately clothed playing lawn tennis in the sunshine a pretty scene ain't it said mr mallard my good lady sitting under the tree and that's my little girl in pink on the far court but i'll take you to your room and you can see em all later he led me through a wide parquet floored hall furnished in pale lemon with huge cloisonne vases an ebonized and gold grand piano and banks of pop flowers and benares brass bowls up a pale oak staircase to a spacious landing where there was a green velvet settee trimmed with silver the blinds were down and the light lay in parallel lines on the floors he showed me my room saying cheerfully you may be a little tired one often is without knowing it after a run through traffic don't come down till you feel quite restored we shall all be in the garden my room was rather warm and smelt of perfumed soap i threw up the window at once but it opened so close to the floor 
and worked so clumsily that i came within an ace of pitching out where i should certainly have ruined a rather lopsided laburnum below as i sat about washing off the journey's dust i began to feel a little tired but i reflected i had not come down here in this weather and among these new surroundings to be depressed so i began to whistle and it was just then that i was aware of a little grey shadow as it might have been a snowflake seen against the light floating at an immense distance in the background of my brain it annoyed me and i shook my head to get rid of it then my brain telegraphed that it was the forerunner of a swift striding gloom which there was yet time to escape if i would force my thoughts away from it as a man leaping for life forces his body forward and away from the fall of a wall but the gloom overtook me before i could take in the meaning of the message i moved toward the bed every nerve already aching with the foreknowledge of the pain that was to be dealt it and sat down while my amazed and angry soul dropped gulf by gulf into that horror of great darkness which is spoken of in the bible and which as auctioneers say must be experienced to be appreciated despair upon despair misery upon misery fear after fear each causing their distinct and separate woe packed in upon me for an unrecorded length of time until at last they blurred together and i heard a click in my brain like the click in the ear when one descends in a diving bell and i knew that the pressures were equalized within and without and that for the moment the worst was at an end but i knew also that at any moment the darkness might come down anew and while i dwelt on this speculation precisely as a man torments a raging tooth with his tongue it ebbed away into the little grey shadow on the brain of its first coming and once more i heard my brain which knew what would recur telegraph to every quarter for help release or diversion the door opened and malaud reappeared i thanked him politely saying i was charmed with my room anxious to meet mrs malaud much refreshed with my wash and so on and so forth beyond a little stickiness at the corners of my mouth it seemed to me that i was managing my words admirably the while that i myself cowered at the bottom of unclimbable pits malaud laid his hand on my shoulder and said you've got it now already ain't it yes i answered it's making me sick it will pass off when you come outside i give you my word it will then pass off come i shambled out behind him and wiped my forehead in the hall you mustn't mind he said i expect the run tired you my good lady is sitting there under the copper beech she was a fat woman in an apricot coloured gown with a heavily powdered face against which her black long-lashed eyes showed like currants and dough i was introduced to many fine ladies and gentlemen of those parts magnificently appointed landaus and covered motors swept in and out of the drive and the air was gay with the merry outcries of the tennis players as twilight drew on they all went away and i was left alone with mr and mrs malaud while tall men-servants and maid-servants took away the tennis and tea-things miss malaud had walked a little down the drive with a light-haired young man who apparently knew everything about every south american railway stock he had told me at tea that these were the days of financial specialization i think it went off beautifully my dear said mr malaud to his wife and to me you feel all right now ain't it of course you do mrs malaud surged across the gravel her husband skipped nimbly before her into the south veranda turned a switch and all holmes croft was flooded with light you can do that from your room also he said as they went in there is something in money ain't it miss malaud came up behind me in the dusk we have not yet been introduced she said but i suppose you are staying the night your father was kind enough to ask me i replied she nodded yes i know and you know too don't you i saw your face when you came to shake hands with mamma you felt the depression very soon it is simply frightful in that bedroom sometimes what do you think it is bewitchment in greece where i was a little girl it might have been but not in england do you think or do you cheer up thea it will all come right he insisted no papa she shook her dark head nothing is right while it comes it is nothing that we ourselves have ever done in our lives 
that i will swear to you said mrs Mallowd suddenly and we have changed our servants several times so we know it is not them never mind let us enjoy ourselves while we can said mr Mallowd, opening the champagne but we did not enjoy ourselves the talk failed there were long silences i beg your pardon i said for i thought some one at my elbow was about to speak ah that is the other thing said miss Mallowd. her mother groaned we were silent again and in a few seconds it must have been a live grief beyond words not ghostly dread or horror but aching helpless grief overwhelmed us each i felt according to his or her nature and held steady like the beam of a burning glass behind that pain i was conscious there was a desire on somebody's part to explain something on which some tremendously important issue hung meantime i rolled bread pills and remembered my sins Mallowed considered his own reflection in a spoon his wife seemed to be praying and the girl fidgeted desperately with hands and feet till the darkness passed on as though the malignant rays of a burning glass had been shifted from us there said miss Mallowed, half rising now you see what makes a happy home oh sell it sell it father mine and let us go away but i've spent thousands on it you shall go to harrogate next week thea dear i'm only just back from hotels i'm so tired of packing cheer up thea it is over you know it does not often come here twice in the same night i think we shall dare now to be comfortable he lifted a dish cover and helped his wife and daughter his face was lined and fallen like an old man's after debauch but his hand did not shake and his voice was clear as he worked to restore us by speech and action he reminded me of a grey-muzzled collie herding demoralized sheep after dinner we sat round the dining-room fire the drawing-room might have been under the shadow for aught we knew talking with the intimacy of gypsies by the wayside or of wounded comparing notes after a skirmish by eleven o'clock the three between them had given me every name and detail they could recall that in any way bore on the house and what they knew of its history we went to bed in a fortifying blaze of electric light my one fear was that the blasting gust of depression would return the surest way of course to bring it i lay awake till dawn breathing quickly and sweating lightly beneath what de quincey inadequately describes as the oppression of inexpiable guilt now as soon as the lovely day was broken i fell into the most terrible of all dreams that joyous one in which all past evil has not only been wiped out of our lives but has never been committed and in the very bliss of our assured innocence before our loves shriek and change countenance we wake to the day we have earned it was a coolish morning but we preferred to breakfast in the south veranda the forenoon we spent in the garden pretending to play games that come out of boxes such as croquet and clock golf but most of the time we drew together and talked the young man who knew all about south american railways took miss Mallowd for a walk in the afternoon and at five Mallowd thoughtfully whirled us all up to dine in town now don't say you will tell the psychological society and bet you will come again said miss Mallowd as we parted because i know you will not you should not say that said her mother you should say good-bye mr perseus come again not him the girl cried he has seen the medusa's head looking at myself in the restaurant's mirrors it seemed to me that i had not much benefited by my weekend next morning i wrote out all my holmescroft notes at fullest length in the hope that by so doing i could put it all behind me but the experience worked on my mind as they say certain imperfectly understood ray's work on the body i am less calculated to make a sherlock holmes than any man i know for i lack both method and patience yet the idea of following up the trouble to its source fascinated me i had no theory to go on except a vague idea that i had come between two poles of a discharge and had taken a shock meant for some one else this was followed by a feeling of intense irritation i waited cautiously on myself expecting to be overtaken by horror of the supernatural but myself persisted in being humanly indignant exactly as though it had been the victim of a practical joke it was in great pains and upheavals that i felt in every fibre but its dominant idea to put it coarsely was to get back a bit of its own 
but by this i knew that i might go forward if i could find the way after a few days it occurred to me to go to the office of mr j m m baxter the solicitor who had sold holmescroft to Malav. i explained that i had some notion of buying the place would he act for me in the matter mr baxter a large grayish throaty voiced man showed no enthusiasm i sold it to mr Malloud. he said it had scarcely do for me to start on the running down tack now but i can recommend i know he's asking an awful price i interrupted and on top of it he wants an extra thousand for what he calls your clean bill of health mr baxter sat up in his chair i had all his attention your guarantee with the house don't do you remember it yes yes that no death had taken place in the house since it was built i remember perfectly he did not gulp as untrained men do when they lie but his jaws moved stickily and his eyes turning towards the deeds boxes on the wall dulled i counted seconds one two three one two three up to ten a man i knew can live through ages of mental depression in that time i remember perfectly his mouth opened a little as though it had tasted old bitterness of course that sort of thing doesn't appeal to me i went on i don't expect to buy a house free from death certainly not no one does but it was mr Malloud's fancy his wife's brother i believe and since we could meet it it was my duty to my clients at whatever cost to my own feelings to make him pay that's really why i came to you i understood from him you knew the place well oh yes always did it originally belonged to some connections of mine the mrs moultrie i suppose how interesting they must have loved the place before the country round about was built up they were very fond of it indeed i don't wonder so restful and sunny i don't see how they could have brought themselves to part with it now it is one of the most constant peculiarities of the english that in polite conversation and i had striven to be polite no one ever does or sells anything for mere money's sake miss agnes the youngest fell ill he spaced his words a little and as they were very much attached to each other that broke up the home naturally i fancied it must have been something of that kind one doesn't associate the staffordshire moultries my demon of irresponsibility at that instant created em with with being hard up i don't know whether we're related to them he answered importantly we may be for our branch of the family comes from the midlands i give this talk at length because i am so proud of my first attempt at detective work when i left him twenty minutes later with instructions to move against the owner of holmescroft with a view to purchase i was more bewildered than any dr watson at the opening of a story why should a middle-aged solicitor turn plover's egg colour and drop his jaw when reminded of so innocent and festal a matter as that no death had ever occurred in a house that he had sold if i knew my english vocabulary at all the tone in which he said the youngest sister fell ill meant that she had gone out of her mind that might explain his change of countenance and it was just possible that her demented influence still hung about holmescroft but the rest was beyond me i was relieved when i reached Malloud's city office and could tell him what i had done not what i thought Malloud was quite willing to enter into the game of the pretended purchase but did not see how it would help if i knew baxter he's the only living soul i can get at who was connected with holmescroft i said ah living soul is good said Malloud. at any rate our little girl will be pleased that you are still interested in us won't you come down some day this week how is it there now i asked he screwed up his face simply frightful he said thea is at droitwich i should like it immensely but i must cultivate baxter for the present you'll be sure and keep him busy your end won't you he looked at me with quiet contempt do not be afraid i shall be a good jew i shall be my own solicitor before a fortnight was over baxter admitted ruefully that Malloud was better than most firms in the business we buyers were coy argumentative shocked at the price of holmescroft inquisitive and cold by turns but mr Malloud, the seller easily met and surpassed us and mr baxter entered every letter telegram and consultation at the proper rates in a cinematograph film of a bill 
at the end of a month he said it looked as though milad thanks to him were really going to listen to reason i was many pounds out of pocket but i had learned something of mr baxter on the human side i deserved it never in my life have i worked to conciliate amuse and flatter a human being as i worked over my solicitor it appeared that he golfed therefore i was an enthusiastic beginner anxious to learn twice i invaded his office with a bag milad lent it full of the spellicans needed in the detestable game and a vocabulary to match the third time the ice broke and mr baxter took me to his links quite ten miles off where in a maze of tramway lines railroads and nursery maids we skelped our divoted way round nine holes like barges plunging through head seas he played vilely and had never expected to meet any one worse but as he realized my form i think he began to like me for he took me in hand by the two hours together after a fortnight he could give me no more than a stroke a hole and when with this allowance i once managed to beat him by one he was honestly glad and assured me that i should be a golfer if i stuck to it i was sticking to it for my own ends but now and again my conscience pricked me for the man was a nice man between games he supplied me with odd pieces of evidence such as that he had known the moultries all his life being their cousin and that miss mary the eldest was an unforgiving woman who would never let bygones be i naturally wondered what she might have against him and somehow connected him unfavourably with mad agnes people ought to forgive and forget he volunteered one day between rounds especially where in the nature of things they can't be sure of their deductions don't you think so it all depends on the nature of the evidence on which one forms one's judgment i answered nonsense he cried i'm lawyer enough to know that there's nothing in the world so misleading as circumstantial evidence never was why have you ever seen men hanged on it hanged people have been supposed to be eternally lost on it his face turned grey again i don't know how it is with you but my consolation is that god must know he must things that seem on the face of em like murder or say suicide may appear different to god eh that's what the murderer and the suicide can always hope i suppose i have expressed myself clumsily as usual the facts as god knows em may be different even after the most clinching evidence i have always said that both as a lawyer and a man but some people won't i don't want to judge em we'll say they can't believe it whereas i say there's always a working chance a certainty that the worst hasn't happened he stopped and cleared his throat now let's come on this time next week i shall be taking my holiday what links i asked carelessly while twins and a perambulator got out of our line of fire a potty little nine-hole affair at a hydro in the midlands my cousins stay there always will not but what the fourth and the seventh holes take some doing you could manage it though he said encouragingly you're doing much better it's only your approach shots that are weak you're right i can't approach for nuts i shall go to pieces while you're away with no one to coach me i said mournfully i haven't taught you anything he said delighted with the compliment i owe all i've learned to you anyhow when will you come back look here he began i don't know your engagements but i've no one to play with at bury mills never have why couldn't you take a few days off and join me there i warn you it will be rather dull it's a throat and gout place baths massage electricity and so forth but the fourth and the seventh holes really take some doing i'm for the game i answered valiantly heaven well knowing that i hated every stroke and word of it that's the proper spirit as their lawyer i must ask you not to say anything to my cousins about holmescroft it upsets em always did but speaking as man to man it would be very pleasant for me if you could see your way to i saw it as soon as decency permitted and thanked him sincerely according to my now well-developed theory he had certainly misappropriated his aged cousin's monies under power of attorney and had probably driven poor agnes moultrie out of her wits but i wished that he was not so gentle and good-tempered and innocent-eyed before i joined him at bury mills hydro i spent a night at holmescroft miss Mallowd had returned from her hydro and first we made very merry on the open lawn in the sunshine over the manners and customs of the english resorting to such places she knew dozens of hydros 
and warned me how to behave in them while mr and mrs m'leod stood aside and adored her ah that's the way she always comes back to us he said pity it wears off so soon ain't it you ought to hear her sing with mirth thou pretty bird we had the house to face through the evening and there we neither laughed nor sung the gloom fell on us as we entered and did not shift till ten o'clock when we crawled out as it were from beneath it it has been bad this summer said mrs m'leod in a whisper after we realized that we were freed sometimes i think the house will get up and cry out it is so bad how have you forgotten what comes after the depression so then we waited about the small fire and the dead air in the room presently filled and pressed down upon us with the sensation but words are useless here as though some dumb and bound power were striving against gag and bond to deliver its soul of an articulate word it passed in a few minutes and i fell to thinking about mr baxter's conscience and agnes moultrie gone mad in the well-lit bedroom that awaited me these reflections secured me a night during which i rediscovered how from purely mental causes a man can be physically sick but the sickness was bliss compared to my dreams when the birds waked on my departure m'leod gave me a beautiful narwhal's horn much as a nurse gives a child sweets for being brave as a dentist's there's no duplicate of it in the world he said else it would have come to old max m'leod and he tucked it into the motor miss m'leod on the far side of the car whispered have you found out anything mr perseus i shook my head then i shall be chained to my rock all my life she went on only don't tell papa i suppose she was thinking of the young gentleman who specialized in south american rails for i noticed a ring on the third finger of her left hand i went straight from that house to bury mills hydro keen for the first time in my life on playing golf which is guaranteed to occupy the mind baxter had taken me a room communicating with his own and after lunch introduced me to a tall horse-headed elderly lady of decided manners whom a white-haired maid pushed along in a bath chair through the park-like grounds of the hydro she was miss mary moultrie and she coughed and cleared her throat just like baxter she suffered she told me it was a moultrie caste mark from some obscure form of chronic bronchitis complicated with spasm of the glottis and in a dead flat voice with a sunken eye that looked and saw not told me what washes gargles pastilles and inhalations had proved most beneficial from her i was passed on to her younger sister miss elizabeth a small and withered thing with twitching lips victim she told me to very much the same sort of throat but secretly devoted to another set of medicines when she went away with baxter in the bath chair i fell across a major of the indian army with gout in his glassy eyes and a stomach which he had taken all round the continent he laid everything before me and him i escaped only to be confided in by a matron with a tendency to follicular tonsillitis and eczema baxter waited hand and foot on his cousins till five o'clock trying as i saw it to atone for his treatment of the dead sister miss mary ordered him about like a dog i warned you it would be dull he said when we met in the smoking-room it's tremendously interesting i said but how about a look round the links unluckily damp always affects my eldest cousin i've got to buy her a new bronchitis kettle arthur's broke her old one yesterday we slipped out to the chemist's shop in the town and he bought a large glittering tin thing whose workings he explained i'm used to this sort of work i come up here pretty often he said i've the family throat too you're a good man i said a very good man he turned towards me in the evening light among the beeches and his face was changed to what it might have been a generation before you see he said huskily there was the youngest agnes before she fell ill you know but she didn't like leaving her sisters never would he hurried on with his odd shaped load and left me among the ruins of my black theories the man with that face had done agnes moultrie no wrong we never played our game i was waked between two and three in the morning from my hygienic bed by baxter in an ulster over orange and white pajamas which i should never have suspected from his character my cousin has had some sort of a seizure he said will you come i don't want to wake the doctor don't want to make a scandal quick so i came quickly and led by the white-haired arthurs in a jacket and petticoat entered a double-bedded room 
reeking with steam and friar's balsam the electrics were all on miss mary i knew her by her height was at the open window wrestling with miss elizabeth who gripped her round the knees miss mary's hand was at her own throat which was streaked with blood she's done it she's done it too miss elizabeth panted hold her help me oh i say women don't cut their throats baxter whispered my god has she cut her throat the maid cried out and with no warning rolled over in a faint baxter pushed her under the wash basins and leaped to hold the gaunt woman who crowed and whistled as she struggled toward the window he took her by the shoulder and she struck out wildly all right she's only cut her hand he said wet towel quick while i got that he pushed her backward her strength seemed almost as great as his i swabbed at her throat when i could and found no mark then helped him to control her a little miss elizabeth leaped back to bed wailing like a child tie up her hand somehow said baxter don't let it drip about the place she he stepped on broken glass in his slippers she must have smashed a pane miss mary lurched towards the open window again dropped on her knees her head on the sill and lay quiet surrendering the cut hand to me what did she do baxter turned towards miss elizabeth in the far bed she was going to throw herself out of the window was the answer i stopped her and sent arthur's for you but we can never hold up our heads again miss mary writhed and fought for breath baxter found a shawl which he threw over her shoulders nonsense said he that isn't like mary but his face worked when he said it you wouldn't believe about aggie john perhaps you will now said miss elizabeth i saw her do it and she's cut her throat too she hasn't i said it's only her hand miss mary suddenly broke from us with an indescribable grunt flew rather than ran to her sister's bed and there shook her as one furious schoolgirl would shake another no such thing she croaked how dare you think so you wicked little fool get into bed mary said baxter you'll catch a chill she obeyed but sat up with the gray shawl round her lean shoulders glaring at her sister i'm better now she panted arthur's let me sit out too long where's arthur's the kettle never mind arthur said baxter you get the kettle i hastened to bring it from the side table now mary as god sees you tell me what you've done his lips were dry and he could not moisten them with his tongue miss mary applied herself to the mouth of the kettle and between indraws of steam said the spasm came on just now while i was asleep i was nearly choking to death so i went to the window i've done it often before without waking any one bessie's such an old maid about draughts i tell you i was choking to death i couldn't manage the catch and i nearly fell out that window opens too low i cut my hand trying to save myself who has tied it up in this filthy handkerchief i wish you had had my throat bessie i never was near a dying she scowled on us all impartially while her sister sobbed from the bottom of the bed we heard a quivering voice is she dead have they took her away oh i never could bear the sight of blood arthur's said miss mary you are an hireling go away it is my belief that arthur's crawled out on all fours but i was busy picking up broken glass from the carpet then baxter seated by the side of the bed began to cross-examine in a voice i scarcely recognized no one could for an instant have doubted the genuine rage of miss mary against her sister her cousin or her maid and that a doctor should have been called in for she did me the honour of calling me doctor she was the last drop she was choking with her throat had rushed to the window for air had near pitched out and in catching at the window bars had cut her hand over and over she made this clear to the intent baxter then she turned on her sister and tongue lashed her savagely you mustn't blame me miss bessie faltered at last you know what we think of night and day i'm coming to that said baxter listen to me what you did mary misled four people into thinking you you meant to do away with yourself isn't one suicide in the family enough oh god help and pity us you couldn't have believed that she cried the evidence was complete now don't you think baxter's finger wagged under her nose can't you think that poor aggie did the same thing at holmescroft when she fell out of the window she had the same throat said miss elizabeth exactly the same symptoms don't you remember mary which was her bedroom i asked of baxter in an undertone over the south veranda looking on to the tennis lawn i nearly fell out of that very window when i was at holmescroft opening it to get some air the sill doesn't come much above your knees i said you hear that mary mary do you hear what this gentleman says won't you believe that what nearly happened to you must have happened to poor aggie that night for god's sake for her sake mary won't you believe 
there was a long silence while the steam kettle puffed if i could have proof if i could have proof said she and broke into most horrible tears baxter motioned to me and i crept away to my room and lay awake till morning thinking more especially of the dumb thing at holmescroft which wished to explain itself i hated miss mary as perfectly as though i had known her for twenty years but i felt that alive or dead i should not like her to condemn me yet at midday when i saw miss mary in her bath chair arthur's behind and baxter and miss elizabeth on either side in the park-like grounds of the hydra i found it difficult to arrange my words now that you know all about it said baxter aside after the first strangeness of our meeting was over it is only fair to tell you that my poor cousin did not die in holmescroft at all she was dead when they found her under the window in the morning just dead under that laburnum outside the window i asked for i suddenly remembered the crooked evil thing exactly she broke the tree in falling but no death has ever taken place in the house so far as we are concerned you can make yourself quite easy on that point mr Malloud's extra thousand for what you call the clean bill of health was something toward my cousin's estate when we sold it was my duty as their lawyer to get it for them at any cost to my own feelings i know better than to argue when the english talk about their duty so i agreed with my solicitor their sister's death must have been a great blow to your cousins i went on the bath chair was behind me unspeakable baxter whispered they brooded on it day and night no wonder if their theory of poor aggie making away with herself was correct she was eternally lost do you believe that she made away with herself no thank god never have and after what happened to mary last night i see perfectly what happened to poor aggie she had the family throat too by the way mary thinks you are a doctor otherwise she wouldn't like your having been in her room very good is she convinced now about her sister's death she'd give anything to be able to believe it but she's a hard woman and brooding along certain lines makes one groovy i have sometimes been afraid of her reason on the religious side don't you know elizabeth doesn't matter brain of a hen always had here arthur summoned me to the bath chair and the ravaged face beneath its knitted shetland wool hood of miss mary moultrie i need not remind you i hope of the seal of secrecy absolute secrecy in your profession she began thanks to my cousins and my sister's stupidity you have found out she blew her nose please don't excite her sir said arthur's at the back but my dear miss moultrie i only know what i've seen of course but it seems to me that what you thought was a tragedy in your sister's case turns out on your own evidence so to speak to have been an accident a dreadfully sad one but absolutely an accident do you believe that too she cried or are you only saying it to comfort me i believe it from the bottom of my heart come down to holmescroft for an hour for half an hour and satisfy yourself of what you don't understand i see the house every day every night i'm always there in spirit waking or sleeping i couldn't face it in reality but you must i said if you go there in the spirit the greater need for you to go there in the flesh go to your sister's room once more and see the window i nearly fell out of it myself it's it's awfully low and dangerous that would convince you i pleaded yet aggie has slept in that room for years she interrupted you've slept in your room here for a long time haven't you but you nearly fell out of the window when you were choking that is true that is one thing true she nodded and i might have been killed as as perhaps aggie was killed in that case your own sister and cousin and maid would have said you had committed suicide miss moultrie come down to holmescroft and go over the place just once you are lying she said quite quietly you don't want me to come down to see a window it is something else i warn you we are evangelicals we don't believe in prayers for the dead as the tree falls yes i dare say but you persist in thinking that your sister committed suicide no no i have always prayed that i might have misjudged her arthur's at the bath chair spoke up oh miss mary you would have it from the first that poor miss aggie had made away with herself and of course miss bessie took the notion from you only master mr john stood out and and i've ad taken my bible oath you was making away with yourself last night miss mary leaned towards me one finger on my sleeve if going to holmescroft kills me she said you will have the murder of a fellow-creature on your conscience for all eternity i'll risk it i answered remembering what torment the mere reflection of her torments had cast on holmescroft and remembering above all the dumb thing that filled the house with its desire to speak i felt that there might be worse things baxter was amazed at the proposed visit but at a nod from that terrible woman went off to make arrangements 
then i sent a telegram to Malad, bidding him and his vacate holmescroft for that afternoon miss mary should be alone with her dead as i had been alone i expected untold trouble in transporting her but to do her justice the promise given for the journey she underwent it without murmur spasm or unnecessary word miss bessie pressed in a corner by the window wept behind her veil and from time to time tried to take hold of her sister's hand baxter wrapped himself in his newly found happiness as selfishly as a bridegroom for he sat still and smiled so long as i know that aggie didn't make away with herself he explained i tell you frankly i don't care what happened she's as hard as a rock mary always was she won't die we let her out onto the platform like a blind woman and so got her into the fly the half-hour crawl to holmescroft was the most racking experience of the day Malloud had obeyed my instructions there was no one visible in the house or the gardens and the front door stood open miss mary rose from beside her sister stepped forth first and entered the hall come bessie she cried i daren't oh i daren't come her voice had altered i felt baxter start there's nothing to be afraid of good heavens said baxter she's running up the stairs we'd better follow let's wait below she's going to the room we heard the door of the bedroom i knew open and shut and we waited in the lemon-coloured hall heavy with the scent of flowers i've never been into it since it was sold baxter sighed what a lovely restful place it is poor aggie used to arrange the flowers restful i began but stopped of a sudden for i felt all over my bruised soul that baxter was speaking truth it was a light spacious airy house full of the sense of well-being and peace above all things of peace i ventured into the dining-room where the thoughtful malads had left a small fire there was no terror there present or lurking and in the drawing-room which for good reasons we had never cared to enter the sun and the peace and the scent of the flowers worked together as is fit in an inhabited house when i returned to the hall baxter was sweetly asleep on a couch looking most unlike a middle-aged solicitor who had spent a broken night with an exacting cousin there was ample time for me to review it all to felicitate myself upon my magnificent acumen barring some errors about baxter as a thief and possibly a murderer before the door above opened and baxter evidently a light sweeper sprang away i've had a heavenly little nap he said rubbing his eyes with the backs of his hands like a child good lord that's not their step but it was i had never before been privileged to see the shadow turn backward on the dial the years ripped bodily off poor human shoulders old sunken eyes filled and the like harsh lips moistened and human john miss mary coughed i know now aggie didn't do it and she didn't do it echoed miss mary i did not think it wrong to say a prayer miss mary continued not for her soul but for our peace then i was convinced then we got conviction the younger sister piped we've misjudged poor aggie john but i feel she knows now wherever she is she knows that we know she is guiltless yes she knows i felt it too said miss elizabeth i never doubted said john baxter his face was beautiful at that hour not from the first never have you never offered me proof john now thank god it will not be the same any more i can think henceforward of aggie without sorrow she tripped absolutely tripped across the hall what ideas these jews have of arranging furniture she spied me behind a big cloisonne vase i've seen the window she said remotely you took great risk in advising me to undertake such a journey however as it turns out i forgive you and i pray you may never know what mental anguish means bessie look at this peculiar piano do you suppose doctor these people would offer one tea i miss mine i will go and see i said and explored malaud's new-built servant's wing it was in the servants hall that i unearthed the malaud family bursting with anxiety tea for three quick i said if you ask me any questions now i shall have a fit so mrs malaud got it and i was butler amid murmured apologies from baxter still smiling and self-absorbed and the cold disapproval of miss mary who thought the pattern of the china vulgar however she ate well and even asked me whether i would not like a cup of tea for myself they went away in the twilight the twilight that i had once feared they were going to an hotel in london to rest after the fatigues of the day and as their fly turned down the drive i capered on the doorstep with the all darkened house behind me then i heard the uncertain feet of the malaz and bade them not to turn on the lights but to feel to feel what i had done for the shadow was gone with the dumb desire in the air they drew short but afterwards deeper breaths like bathers entering chill water separated one from the other moved about the hall tiptoed upstairs raced down and then miss Malad and i believe her mother though she denies this embraced me i know Malad did it was a disgraceful evening to say we rioted through the house as to put it mildly we played a sort of blind man's buff along the darkest passages in the unlighted drawing-room 
and little dining-room calling cheerily to each other after each expiration that here and here and here the trouble had removed itself we came up to the bedroom mine for the night again and sat the women on the bed and we men on chairs drinking in blessed draughts of peace and comfort and cleanliness of soul while i told them my tale in full and received fresh praise thanks and blessings when the servants returned from their day's outing gave us a supper of cold fried fish Malad had sense enough to open no wine we had been practically drunk since nightfall and grew incoherent on water and milk i like that baxter said Malad. he's a sharp man the death wasn't in the house but he ran it pretty close ain't it and the joke of it is that he supposes i want to buy the place from you i said are you selling not for twice what i paid for it now said Malad. i'll keep you in furs all your life but not our holmescroft no never our holmescroft said miss Malad. we'll ask him here on tuesday mamma they squeezed each other's hands now tell me said mrs Malad, that tall one i saw out of the scullery window did she tell you she was always here in the spirit i hate her she made all this trouble it was not her house after she had sold it what do you think i suppose i answered she brooded over what she believed was her sister's suicide night and day she confessed she did and her thoughts being concentrated on this place they felt like a like a burning glass burning glass is good said Malad. i said it was like a light of blackness turned on us cried the girl twiddling her ring that must have been when the tall one thought worse about her sister in the house ah the poor aggie said mrs Malad. the poor aggie trying to tell every one it was not so no wonder we felt something wished to say something do you max do you remember that night we need not remember any more Malad interrupted it is not our trouble they have told each other now do you think then miss Malad, that those two the living ones were actually told something upstairs in your in the room i can't say at any rate they were made happy and they ate a big tea afterwards as your father says it is not our trouble any longer thank god amen said Malad. now thea let us have some music after all these months with mirth that pretty bird ain't it you ought to hear that and in the half-lighted hall thea sang an old english song that i had never heard before with mirth thou pretty bird rejoice thy maker's praise enhance lift up thy shrill and pleasant voice thy god is high advanced thy food before he did provide and gives it in a fitting side wherewith be thou sufficed why shouldst thou now unpleasant be thy wrath against god venting that he a little bird made thee thy silly head tormenting because he made thee not a man o peace he hath well thought thereon therewith be thou sufficed End of section fifteen Section 16 of Actions and Reactions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Actions and Reactions by Rudyard Kipling. The Rabbi's Song. If thought can reach to heaven, on heaven let it dwell for fear that thought be given like power to reach to hell for fear the desolation and darkness of thy mind perplex a habitation which thou hast left behind let nothing linger after no whispering ghost remain in wall or beam or rafter of any hate or pain cleanse and call home thy spirit deny her leave to cast on aught thy heirs inherit the shadow of her past for think in all thy sadness what road our griefs may take whose brain reflect our madness or whom our terrors shake for think lest any languish by cause of thy distress the arrows of our anguish fly farther than we guess our lives are tears as water are spilled upon the ground god giveth no man quarter yet god a means hath found though faith and hope have vanished and even love grows dim a means whereby his banished be not expelled from him end of section sixteen recording by phone end of actions and reactions by rudyard kipling